call to order the city council meeting at 6 p.m. Um, the first item on the agenda is the agenda. Is there a motion on the agenda? And if councilors can uh, please turn on their video, if they're able just so I can see folks if they're wanting to be recognized. Um, okay, um, is there a motion on the agenda? Can someone please make a motion on the agenda. I move to amend, adopt, uh, sorry, thank you. Note written materials for agenda item 3.01, UVM code enforcement update to spring move at per Gail Champnois. Note written material for consent agenda item 610, communication, Catherine Sad, CAO, regarding calendar for FY21. Add to the consent agenda item 6.13, communication, Sarah Denny, regarding requiring masks in stores with the motion to waive the reading, accept the communication, place it on file. Add to the consent agenda item 6.14, communication Mary Campbell regarding masks um, with the motion to waive the reading, accept the communication, place it on file. Add to the consent agenda 6.15, communication Martha Day regarding masks. Um, add to the agenda item 6.16, .6, communication Mary Campbell regarding um, masks. No COVID retail response with the motion to waive the reading, accept the communication, place it on file. Add to the consent agenda item, item 6.17, communication regarding vote on mask mandate. Add to the consent agenda item 6.18, communication Carl and Ellie Potter regarding retail consumer masks. Add Councilor Paulino as a co-sponsor for agenda item 7.06, resolution COVID-19 emergency order, wearing face coverings regarding retail stores. Um, note revised version of this agenda item per city attorney's office. Add Councilor Paul as co-sponsor for agenda item 7.07 resolution. Remove everybody loves a parade mural. Um, sponsored by Pine, Dan Carpenter, Stormbrook, Hanson, Perry. Um, and Pine, note proposed amendments to this agenda item per Councilor Carpenter. Second. Councillor Hightower, we have a second from Councillor Paul. Um, all those in favor, any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, anyone opposed? That passes unanimously, uh, which brings us to item number two, city place update from CEDO. Um, we'll start with a public update, and then I believe there is a request to go yeah. into executive session um, following that. Uh, Councillor Paul? I, I just a uh, point of order. I, um, did you prefer to just uh, wait until we were out of executive session and going into the public forum before the Pledge of Allegiance, or um, how did you, or were you planning? Oh, on? thank you for that. Um, I was going to plan to just go out of executive session once we actually started the normal meeting um, to, at seven um, to go into that. Um, so, but thank you for that clarification. No problem. Sorry about that. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. No, it's okay. Um, I was looking at this more as a work session. So um, anyways, um, Mr. Mayor, would you like to kick us off or uh, Mr. Glassberg, are you going to be starting us off? Uh, thank you, President Tracy. Yeah, uh, Jeff Glassberg, the city's lead on, on the project, will uh, we'll, we'll kick off the update. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Glassberg. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, President Tracy. Um, first, I just wanted to start on a personal note with a thank you to the city councilors and the mayor for the extraordinary efforts that have been made over the, the last two months by the city that really benefit, benefit the entire state. So thank you for all that hard work. Uh, secondly, I wanted to acknowledge a number of new councilors who have joined us. I would look forward to the opportunity at some point to meet with you to be able to provide a more in-depth background to a complicated project. So we'll just dive in this evening, but I do look forward to that opportunity. Uh, to set the frame for those counselors and all of us, just as a reminder of the expected outcomes for the city from this project. Uh, the first was the restoration of the St. Paul and Pine Street right-of-ways, reestablishing the city street grid. Uh, the second was incremental tax revenue, often referred to as TIF, uh, 
tax increment financing, incremental tax revenue generated by redevelopment sufficient to pay for those improvements on St. Paul and Pine Streets, as well as improvements to Bank and Cherry Streets. Thirdly, a substantial number of housing units are to be developed, including additional affordable units in the downtown. Fourth, a mix of uses, including retail and office space that would create substantial new jobs within downtown. And fifth, a range of ancillary benefits, including public access and environmental goals. So again, that was the broad range of outcomes expected by the city. In terms of an update for the council on where this stands, when I was last before the council on February 10th, I reported progress on some fronts and a lack of progress on others. Uh, at that point, the developer had conducted two well-attended public engagement sessions to review what I'll call City Place 2.0, a revised program and plan for the development of the site. A third session, which was associated with uh, permit application requirements uh, was held subsequently on February 27th, and that was specifically um, for neighboring property owners, but also included the broad public. Uh, the developer continued to refine its design and program in preparation for submission of their permit applications. And to preserve TIF capacity, the city had presented a request to the state board, uh, VEPSI, Vermont Economics Progress Council, back in December, uh, requesting a project change. VEPSI deferred action at that time, uh, pending submission of an amended development agreement among the city and BTC Mall Associates documenting the revised project program and related business terms. Based on the input from the council on February 10th, an amended development agreement was delivered to the developer on February 18th. Since uh, March, there has not been significant progress on the project. The permit applications for the main redevelopment site, as well as 67 Cherry Street, the former Macy's property, uh, those permit applications were not submitted prior to the stay home order. Um, had they been submitted, there still would have been delayed, but they were not. Um, certainly COVID has had some significant impact on project progress, just in terms of the team and their working effort, uh, and the response due on the proposed revision to the development agreement is unresolved. It has not been forthcoming. The developer continues to voice confidence in Burlington and in the project over the long term. However, I'm a realist and I believe that some new challenges may lie ahead. Uh, certainly recovery of downtown retail businesses, as well as a picture of what the retail environment in general looks like going forward, may be some cause for concern. The availability of commercial financing for some program elements could be difficult to obtain over the next 12 months. Uh, and finally, the long-term uh, health of UVMMC and their need for office and administrative space is something that may be questioned in the near term. As a result, the purpose in coming before the council tonight was to try to provide this background and specifically to try to reset the city's expectations of the developer regarding the timeline and terms for that development agreement amendment uh, to move that process forward 
and specifically would like to discuss with the council in executive session some of those points of negotiation. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to try to address comments or questions you may have at this point. Thank you, Mr. Glassberg. Um, are there questions from the council? Councilor Pine, go ahead. Sure, thanks, uh, Mr. President. Um, Jeffrey, if you could, for the council and for the public, um, I guess give us at a high level, um, if you were in our seats and your constituents asked you, um, what's the likelihood that this project is going to um, come to fruition at this point? Help us answer that question. So I, I, I want to clarify that you're asking about fruition, not a specific schedule question, exactly. correct? Yes. Oh, this is still a very highly desirable site in the center of a vibrant downtown. I think the prospects for redevelopment of this site remain very high. Has this been a saga? Absolutely. Are people frustrated? Absolutely. But the basics that make that location valuable don't change. Thank you. All set, Councilor Pine? Yeah. Okay, other councilors. Councilor Hansen, go ahead. Thanks. Um, and so to kind of follow up on that, the other half of that question in terms of timeline, do you have any sense of what scale of timeline we might be looking at for this? You know, that question will ultimately have to be answered by the developer, but Councilor Hansen, while it's possible that construction could commence this calendar year. I'm skeptical that that will be the case. Um, and I would anticipate delay. That hasn't been told to us, but I think realistically, we may expect that. Thank you. Yeah, and I understand and I want to make sure the public understands this is your estimation based on the, the discussions that you've had and um, rather, I don't want people to take that as, as fact, um, oh, which you, you've made clear. I just want to reiterate for the public. Thank you. And, and it's directly responsive to those concerns that I outlined for you that are my opinion in terms of yep. what those new challenges may be. Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Hanson. I see Councilor Freeman and then Mason. Go ahead, Councilor Freeman. Thank you. Council President Tracy. Um, thank you, Jeff, for um, bringing this update. Um, as I was just listening to your response to Councillor Pine and Councillor Hanson, I was just, because I've been, I was thinking about this and um, when the media re reached out, of course, questioning about a timeline and et cetera and so forth. Um, you know, what I basically said is that if, I guess, you know, my question is kind of around like, you know, I understand we have very specific frustrations around um, the way that this project has um, not come to sort of fruition under what we had sort of anticipated going, you know, along from now. But I have to under, like, I have to think that maybe during this time, there are just general, a lot of general uncertainties in um, sort of construction and in that trade sort of broadly. And what I said was just that, you know, I just want to make sure that as we reopen and return back to business, um, that we're doing it safely. And so I guess I'm wondering, um, in that, so now I, I feel like I'm having a hard time parsing out what are um, sort of the underlying issues that were maybe already present where Brookfield was struggling to be at capacity just under normal circumstances to bring this project to fruition versus like the COVID um, sort of impact um, and how, some of that might, even though it feels frustrating to have a further delay because we've had so many delays, how some of that might just be because we are in the middle of um, this pandemic. So I don't, does that make sense? I, uh, yes, Councillor Freeman, I'll try to respond. So the, the presentation of what I described as City Place 2.0 was an effort to try to 
address market conditions mm -hmm. and construction costs and have a plan that was more responsive on both points. Um, I think the question you're asking is, is whether um, despite that, uh, the impact of COVID may require uh, another look at that plan perhaps, um, or if it may impact the implementation of that plan. Uh, and again, uh, this is the developer story to tell, but I think realistically, um, certainly if, if, if you're a banker looking at this, the situation has changed, even if you know, the plan has not. So I think it will take a little time for market conditions to settle out, for financial markets to settle out. Those are likely impact. Am I answering your question? Yeah, sort of. I just sort of, um, I guess, so I hear, what I heard you say is that it's, if I heard correctly, um, that we're not anticipated to, that the project is not anticipated to break ground or commence within this calendar year. Is that correct? That I heard you say that? I'm, I'm sorry, I had a, a moment with my internet connection. So. Uh, I think it is still, uh, it's it's conceivable that construction could start this calendar year, but I'm skeptical that that will be the case. Right. So I'm just anticipating, I know we've heard a lot of people say like there's potential issues with um, seeing a like an upsurgence in um, just the health issues and, and everything coming back in the fall and that being, I understand it's going to impact market conditions, but it's also just going to impact people's capacity to um, to be at work. So I, I guess I'm just, I just wanted to keep that in mind as much as I want to see sort of a project being actualized or at least some sort of movement on this thing that feels like it's just basically a, been a hole in the ground for a really long time. I'm just trying to sort of think critically about all the moving parts that we found ourselves in with this sort of sudden public health emergency. Um, but I'll, um, I'll stay tuned and um, listen in for the executive session as well. Thank you, Councillor Freeman. Uh, I had Councillor Mason followed by Councillor Hansen. If other councillors wanna get in, um, please let me know. Go ahead, Councillor Mason. Thank you, uh, President Tracy. Um, Mr. Glassberg, thank you for the presentation. I, I wanna talk for a second about timing when we last left off, the developer had articulated, you know, the delay would be, any delay would be associated with permits and litigation um, in light of, or at least what I heard you say, which is no, neither municipal permit for, or the municipal permits for either project were not applied for. And my assumption is they didn't apply for the Act 250 permit. Um, my assumption is that that's gonna blow us well beyond this year. And similarly on the litigation, at least currently, you know, courts are shut down other than for, you know, any essential work. So my assumption is that also pushes us back. And after that question, and I'm sensitive to we're going into executive session, I'm just curious from a process perspective where we're going, you know, as a council before COVID hit, we were sort of providing input on the amendment to the development agreement. I'm guessing we're not on that track anymore because it sounds like you haven't had a, a meaningful conversation with them to better understand how this pandemic is impacting their plans. Um, and I can't see you, Jeff, so it's odd to forgive me now I can. Did you want me to respond at this point? Please, if you would. Okay, so the uh, first distinction I would make is <clears throat> there were two discrete permit processes. Right. One was for a reuse of an existing building. Right. Um, and if there's a demand and a, and a customer, that's a project that could potentially proceed in the nearer term than the redevelopment of the mid block. So I just wanted to make that initial distinction uh, in terms of timing. Um, and, and in fact, the uh, reason for executive session this evening would be to get your further input on pursuing that development agreement amendment track. All, all set, Councillor Mason? Yes, that, that is helpful. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, so I have Councilor Hanson next. Councilor Hanson, you have already spoken once though. So are there any other councilors who are on first round who haven't spoken yet who'd like to get in? Okay, seeing none, go ahead, Councilor Hanson. Great, thanks. Um, so, so Jeff, you mentioned a couple of times, it's the developer's story to tell, which is true. Um, so do you have any sense of their willingness to come before the council soon and, and give an update directly? Yes, we're going to uh, propose a time frame for that, and that's part of the series of actions that we want to review with you in, in executive session. But there is the expectation that they should be back before the public. There was some momentum. There, there was an, uh, some goodwill being rebuilt, and all of that has come to a stop. The effort should be to restart that process. Okay, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you sharing that with the public as well. I don't I think that is beneficial for the public and I don't think that it undermines our negotiation at all. So that's helpful and thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hansen. Are there other councillors with questions? Councillor Paulino, go ahead. You're on mute. Sorry about that. I don't know if you recall, but um Brookfield had um, publicly said, I think at their last appearance, that Macy's was, um, I think according to them, an unknown at that time. It was, un it was clear, at least to me, based on their comment, their public comments, that they hadn't, they certainly weren't publicly committing to starting Macy's first, and then, which always made sense, um, and then doing the bigger one, it seemed to, it seemed that they wanted to include it as a package. Um, one, has that changed? And my other question is, um, what kind of contact or do you feel you've been having the last 60 days since February with them or meetings? How has that changed um, when you were meeting more regularly and you were having the, you know, you were doing the lead up to the permitting process? Sure. Um, I want to answer your uh, your first question. Could you remind me? I've got the second question written down. The first yeah. The, so the the first one was about how they said basically that uh, oh, the relationship between the two projects. They said I don't something. To, I think I asked them in the public hearing when are you going to start or do you have a start date for the Macy's project? Which I think we were all concerned with losing the you know this great tenant that could not just create downtown jobs, but downtown revenue. Um, and their answer was basically, I don't know. And it was, it was kind of cryptic and it was clear to me that it was a, it was a package deal. Uh, you know, we'll start Macy's if our amendments get approved, or at least that's the sense I seem to get out of it. Uh, I, to, to some extent that may be the case. I think the, the line is actually somewhat simpler. Um, and that is an assurance of, of uh, an agreement with UVMMC to secure moving ahead with that project. And this becomes of a piece because just as the residents of Burlington want to know what's going to happen with the overall project, so does UVMMC. So to some extent, Councillor Polino, they they remain a package, although there was the capacity because it's an existing building that doesn't require as extensive a permit process. There was the potential to be able to move ahead, in fact, with that renovation piece first on 67 Cherry Street. Have I answered that question? What? So have they indicated to you that they're willing to put shovel on the ground for that building first without having a final agreement on the design of the bigger block? I'm thinking about your question. I'm not sure if we framed it exactly that way. Mm -hmm. The uh, plan has always been to move these along simultaneously with the ability to start Macy's, the former Macy's sooner because it exists and it's a simplified permit process. Okay. I'll start, Councilor Paulino. Um, 
Yes. Okay, uh, it is 6.30, so are there any other counselors um, want to get in, just wanting to start to move us towards the, the executive session? Anything else from the council? Um, Jeff, just wanted to ask you uh, on my, for my part about the hotel use. Um, you know, I think that this crisis has really revealed how becoming, uh, how being too dependent on, uh, on tourist dollars um, carries with it certain risks. Uh, and I, I, I think that that's been really made obvious through this. And that's something that I've really had as a concern just in general with the hotels, the, given that there are so many hotels already planned or being um, built uh, in the area. Um, how, what have your, what have the, what is the conversation around that particular element of the project look like? Mm -hmm. uh, there has not been in-depth further discussion about that element, President Tracy. Your concern is shared by a, a range of investors and lenders. And I think, you know, realistically to obtain financing for hotel properties, it will take some time to see occupancy rates come back before there's going to be a willingness to invest new dollars to create new inventory. You reference uh, a deep pipeline of a, a, a number of potential projects within the market area. Um, some of those may fall by the wayside or be delayed, perhaps. There are certain unique characteristics to this site as compared to a number of the other projects that were in the radar that might speak to a continued market demand for this site. Um, and certainly just taking it up a, a level, if you will, the ability of this site to support, um, I'm going to say it, other public gathering opportunities, meeting, convention, development within downtown Burlington would speak to a unique type of market for that hotel use as compared to some others that are in non-metro, non-downtown locations. So you're, you're correct. I think it's going to take a while for the market to come back for financing those properties and um, lenders and investors will want to be assured that there's demand for that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Glassberg. So anyone else? Okay, seeing none, uh, Mr. Mayor, will you please just clarify the what the request for executive uh, session is based upon? Um, the request for executive session is um, to uh, have discussion with the council about um, on the ongoing negotiations uh, with the with developer um, and to get the council's input into those negotiations. Thank you very much. Um, is there a finding based off of that explanation? Someone prepared to make a motion with regards to make a finding? Yeah. Councilor Hansing. Um, I might need help, but I would find that um, due to the need to enter into a discussion about ongoing negotiations with the developer, premature disclosure, disclosure of which would put the city um, would undermine the city's ability to negotiate um, that we go into executive session. Is that sufficient? Attorney Blackwood, is that a sufficient motion or sufficient finding in your mind? I think that's probably good enough, yes. Okay, all right. So we have a finding. There's a second from Councillor Mason. Uh, any discussion on that finding? Okay, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, that was unanimous. Now we need that second motion, which is based on that finding. The motion to go into executive session. Is there is anyone prepared to offer that motion? Councilor Stromberg. Based on that finding, I move that we enter into executive session. Do you have a motion? Is there a second? Second from Councilor Paul. Uh, any discussion on that? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously and we will go into executive session.
uh, would you please clarify who's to be included in that executive session and um, how counselors are to get on um, to that executive session? Do we have a another link in our in our inboxes? Yes, you should all have just received the email from Jordan, um, which has the link. And um, if the executive session could include the city attorney's office, Mr. Glassberg, mayor's office. Um, uh, Okay, wonderful. All right, so we'll be back on this uh, at seven um, for the members of the public to start the regular city council meeting. We'll go into executive session right now. So switch over to that and then we'll come back to this. Once we get all the counselors right back online, we'll go ahead and get started with an important update from code enforcement and, uh, and the University of Vermont regarding the move out. I just wanna make sure that we have all the counselors on, seeing only a couple so far, give everyone a chance to get back on and then we'll, uh, turn it over to our two presenters. We have Gail Champnoise and Bill Ward with us tonight. Um, so thank you to both of you for being here. And before we do that, um, once we get everyone on, I also want to just uh, take a moment and do the Pledge of Allegiance. So. Nine counselors. We're still missing Councillor Shannon, Councillor Mason. Oh, I see you, Councillor Mason. Okay. Um, see, don't see Councillor Jang. Carpenter and okay. Still missing Councillor Jang. I'm here. Oh, you're here. Okay. Right here. I believe we're just missing Councilor Shannon. Okay, now we have Councilor Shannon. All right, so would everybody please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance. The United States of America. To the republic for which, for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you, counselors, and thank you to our, our presenters also for being patient. I uh, apologize again for being a few minutes late uh, to this, this session. Um, I, we will go ahead and uh, turn it over to um, Bill Ward and Gail Champnoise from the University of Vermont. Bill is our the head of uh, code enforcement and permitting for the city. Um, and we have a presentation for them uh, and after which uh, counselors will be able to ask questions. So um, Bill, are you are you gonna get us started? Yes, I am. Are you able to hear me okay? Yep. Okay, so I'm just gonna give a few uh, updates on the move out on communications, uh, plan for trash removal that we see this time of year, and then some logistical updates about move out and then I'll turn it over to Gail for a much more detailed presentation from UVM with the PowerPoint. And then I'll come back to be discussing some of the, the move in strategies. So as far as the specific communications, our team uh, at the permitting inspections department, specifically it's the um, housing division. We're working with UVM and Champlain College regularly on making sure that our communications are consistent with theirs. Um, in fact, that's part of why UVM is here tonight because uh, Gail and I work really well together and I think it's been about 20 years she's been doing the move out. Uh, the last 10 have been with me. Um, the Resource Recovery Center this year is a new tool for us and we're using it to both provide information for renters and for property owners, but also help with move out questions or problems specifically that renters have special needs during the COVID-19 emergency uh, or for property owners if they have issues they can contact us through the resource and recovery center. On the same website there's a renter frequently asked questions. UVM has a very similar one with sp student specific move out uh, questions a frequently asked questions page and uh, the housing division manager, Patty Wayman, in our department has set up a group email list so that we can communicate directly with a group of all the 
property owners so that we have communications on move out issues and guidance about things like uh, cleaning, and just normally cleaning between tenants, but uh, there's a very different kind of cleaning that we'll be looking for this time of year. Uh, many of what's happened, many of the things that have happened so far are, are pretty evident by just talking with renters and with property owners. I've seen them out, uh, I've witnessed it myself, give an update about what's happened uh, in just a minute about what I've seen on the streets. Um, but we're in regular communication with the Vermont Apartment Owners Association to make sure they're staying consistent with our message as well. Um, Gail's gonna be giving details on the trash events that we have, but we have a, a couple coming up. Uh, it's not gonna be the standard move out, but we will have uh, something available for renters. And uh, we also will be patrolling regularly. Our code inspectors, part of the, the code division, will be out patrolling. And we, um, we know that people are watching. Uh, we, we have an overflow dumpster so that city staff can handle some rogue issues if they end up on city property. And I know people are watching because uh, one resident reported my license plate this weekend on Sunday when I was out removing trash, they thought I was actually uh, dumping. So it's encouraging that people are watching and seeing what's going on out there. So we ask them to stay vigilant and let us know uh, either through resource and recovery, but particularly see quick fix for illegal dumping related issues. Um, I can tell you we've handled uh, 151 in, uh, issues of trash closed since April 1st, and the average time to close is 1.6 days. So we're on it. We'll try to do our best to stay at that rate, get things cleaned up quickly. This weekend when I was out, I saw both Saturday and Sunday an opportunity to speak with uh, 18 different groups that were moving out to get some real data. And um, those folks that had U-Hauls or were moving vans, 70% uh, of those folks were in town moves and 30% told me that they were same day travelers. So they had traveled from out of state here getting belongings and they were returning to their state once they got things packed up. Uh, the primary reason they told me they were doing the same day travel was because there's no hotels for them to stay at. What I saw though firsthand on both days this weekend was a high level of cooperation between renters and property owners. A lot of folks who are moving are moving in early to their new place. Um, and for those that aren't, it, they seem to be moving into storage facilities. I checked in today with the U-Haul manager on Riverside Avenue. He told me there were uh, 50 of their trucks that were out in Burlington this weekend that had been rented. Uh, 40 of them were uh, taking items specifically to storage facilities and the trucks were being returned. So he had some real-time information. That helps me know that a lot of folks are already moving out, which is encouraging, sort of flattening the curve on the move out. Uh, we've also been working with the move out companies like Busca and Local Muscle. I called them to see if, what their availability would be if renters needed them to help with move out. I've also asked to see if they have estimates if we need to help out or if UVM can be prepared to help us if renters can't do it themselves. If we get the call through the uh, Resource and Recovery Center, we will work with tenants to find a way to help them out. Um, I don't wanna to go too much further into details that Gail will be speaking about, but I will turn it over and uh, then talk about move in when Gail is done. Thank you very much, Bill. And I just wanna thank the mayor's office, the city council and all the staff for the Research and Recovery Center for the phenomenal work that they're doing to help with impacts of COVID-19 on our entire community. I really appreciate it. Uh, for those of you who are not as familiar with our office uh, or may need a little updating, um, the, uh, I, what I'd like to show is just a few of the things that our office does do. So we help, st our students have to live on campus for two years. And then in their second year, we do off-campus living workshops. And we're also going online with our off-campus living workshop program. So they have the tools that they need to be successful off-campus. And then once they're off-campus, to provide them with all the support and resources that we can and uh, identify issues that face both the students and also the non-student neighbors. Uh, we work a lot with student neighbor relations. And then uh, we have a restorative approach. We wanna do things with people in the neighborhoods, not to or for them. And we do a lot around dialogue when things happen because we've created relationships with uh, individuals on, in, in the neighborhood. We have a better chance of things being uh, Timely, getting things conflict early is really important, as well as coming to some good resolution. 
And then we also provide some neighborhood grants. So if students and non-students in a neighborhood want to do a project, we'll help them not only with funding, we ask them what they need and what would help. And then we also provide staffing and uh, we have our students come, we have the Upper Bound program come, just a couple of examples. And we work a lot with, for example, the Burlington Health and Rehab Center as well. So we have a lot of neighborhood partners. And uh, so that's a little bit about what our office does. I just wanna stress that I work with the off-campus population. So I know questions may come up about the on-campus population or the full opening of campus, but in my prior conversations with Counselor Max Tracy, uh, I talked about that, that's, that I'm the right resource for the off-campus and that if other things come up, I'm gonna to refer to Joe Spidell, who's our government relations liaison with the city. And then on that second slide, uh, just a few of the things that we are doing, and Bill mentioned uh, spring move COVID-19 style. Uh, so we have come up with a plan for an alternatives this year. And then the other is we have an off-campus life newsletter and it goes out monthly. We've been actually been sending it out weekly and sometimes twice a week because the COVID orders from the governor are coming out um, on a regular basis. We wanna make sure everybody has families and students have the best information. And also we wanted to make sure that we started in April with some of our move out information so students were prepared. And then one of the ways we did that, if you wanna to go to the next slide, uh, is we did a survey of students and we wanted to find out a number of different things. And the survey went out in our off-campus life newsletter. These were pre preliminary results because our survey results, if, uh, the survey finalized after I got the information into uh, Lori Olberg. So I, I, I'll just let you go, I'll just go through some of the things that I think that would be most relevant to this conversation. So 856 students filled out the survey. For those who are currently living in their off-campus rental, 529 of them, 187 of the students were not living in their rental. And as a, you may be familiar with when spring, uh, when we, we had our spring break, most of our students were away and the, and the university made that decision to do online uh, learning. And some of the students never came back to the community or they came back and then they left after that virtual learning went on for the entire semester. So uh, that's why um, we, we wanted to break it down between those that were still living here and those that, that had left. And then we asked um, how many students were planning on living in the Burlington area for the lease period starting on June 1st. And that question was asked of the students who were living there now. And so 68% or 352 individuals who answered the survey, they're actually in Burlington now and staying in Burlington and moving in on June 1st. And then there were 136 of them who said, no, they're, they're leaving the, the city. So just wanted to let you know that there's a lot of movement going from one rental to another in Burlington. And then we asked uh, of those students who have left, we asked if they're returning uh, to their rental to move out their belongings. And 101 said yes. So that's 101 that will be coming back into the community to get their belongings and leave again. And then uh, 49 said no, they already had their belongings out, 49 people. So I uh, just wanted to give you an idea of the movement that might occur there. And then of those people that are coming back to get their belongings, 40% of those people are going to stay in a June rental. So they're only making one trip into Vermont. So those are some of the information that we were able to gather about what the movement might look like. And then we also wanted to know what's the week when most people are moving. And it was the week of May 18th and May 25th. So that gave us a really good guidelines for when we should, should have these alternate events for spring move out project. And then if you go to the next slide. And so uh, here's what we've done so far for move out um, actions. So we, we worked with Bill and Code and his whole team, which are remarkable. We've been really good partners for a lot of years. And this is our 20th celebration of SMOP. And I'm, it's kind of the most unusual we never could have predicted. But uh, because we have such a good working relationship, we were able to, to move pretty quickly into what that al alternative might look like. We do that off-campus life newsletter, which I've mentioned. We did a special move out edition and we've done move out tips since April. And then we're doing door-to-door -door flyering the neighborhoods this week. And that will include both information about the alternative move out events, as well as uh, a lot of the safe distancing, wear a mask and, and some of the other uh, order information that we thought was appropriate to hand out. We do social media posts. Um, I did an update to the mayor's office and the city council in a May 1st communication to the city council and the mayor's office. 
um, Bill had referenced already that we're trying to keep the uh, FAQ sheets on both UVM's official COVID-19 site as well as the city's up to date with move out and move in information. And uh, we did this off-campus survey that I just uh, talked about. And then we did a live Teams event with President Garamella and our Vice Provost uh, Annie Stevens and, it, and, and also with Vermont tenants in our office. And it was all about move out tips, how to have a successful move out in the city. And then the last slide um, is about move in actions. So going out this week is a communication from our vice provost, Annie Stevens, and it's to rising juniors and seniors. So they're the current sophomores who are gonna be moving off campus in their junior year. And then the current juniors who will be seniors and then also graduate students and medical students. And it's what they need to do and what they should expect coming back to Vermont. And we are constantly updating the, the governor's orders, but that is primary piece of the communications. And then we also know that the parents and the families, it's really good for them to have that kind of information in hand. So we're also sending it to parents of the undergraduates who will be living off campus. And then we also hope to do another survey with our current sophomores moving into their junior year to get an idea of when they're thinking of moving into the city. So that would be, uh, if um, that gets the go ahead, we'll do that this week. And with a short turnaround time, we're finding out that most of our students answer the survey within the first two days it's out. Uh, and so uh, it, it's enabled us to do some of these quicker turnaround surveys when needed. And again, social media posts and then updates to the mayor's office and the city council. Great, and uh, Jordan, if, Jordan, if you have the um, the move out or the move in um, slide that I had sent to you, I just wanted to have a couple of quick bullet points. I know Gail touched on a couple of them, but I think it um, one it it says we didn't get a chance to go over the specific notes that each of us was going to say, but it does say there's a lot of partnership because the some of the things I'm going to say will overlap. But um, first, I want to remind everyone and anyone that's watching particularly, that the move-in that'll happen after June 1st or through the fall, right now the governor's quarantine order remains in effect. So quarantining is for anyone entering Vermont from out of state. Um, the University of Vermont's gonna be communicating, as Gail said, in the coming days about direction for students. Um, and the city has been and will continue to, put, to have input into the communications. We're lucky to have good partners. Um, we're working with UVM to understand the need for the storage for renter belongings and um, we're hoping that items that need to be stored until fall, uh, UVM has the capacity for helping students, but there's also capacity for folks that can look to uh, local movers, the information I shared earlier for moving out. Um, and for those that do still need help and can't get the resources themselves, the city can help through their resource and recovery center. Uh, the city and UVM is going to, are going to be working on comparable support for off-campus students. That's again June 1st through the fall move-in. Uh, we are uh, working on a protocol with UVM uh, in the state of Vermont for a supportive uh, isolation or quarantine program for renters who are returning to Vermont from out of state on June 1st. And we are at also asking that UVM and the state work with us uh, on a testing protocol to have in place by June 1st, if we can, for move-in. And we expect ongoing work on this right up until the end of this month. So some of these are still being finalized, but there's a lot of information we have just shared. Want to hit, hit a lot of that at a high level and answer questions if you have them. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, if you could just go off of uh, the screen share mode, just so I can see all the Okay, great. All right, I see Councillor Hightower. Get got you, Councillor Shannon and Councillor Carpenter. Go ahead, Councillor Hightower. Thank you, President Tracy. Um, I guess I had, thanks for the update, first of all. Appreciate all of you being here to present. My question is um, kind of beyond the move in actions. I know that we still have the governor's order in place and um, you talked about one communication in terms of what students can expect coming from Vermont. I think I'm a little worried about like renorming um, for students and what that looks like in terms of like just Vermont having higher precautions than most, than many of the other states that they'll be coming from. And 
I know that there's always the governor's orders, but I find what is most effective is just what peers are doing. Um, and so if the if UVM has thought at all about what that renorming looks like and what it entails. And thank you for your question. Uh, so for the renorming in every communication we put out, we talk about wearing masks, the six feet of diff distance. We've also used like the catamount as an example, the six feet, trying to get some visual pictures about what that, uh, what that might look like. Uh, I, I, I will explore that a little bit more because maybe some personal stories. We had shared a few of the personal stories that came out of our early survey about what students were experiencing here, how many of them had roommates who came in and they were not self doing the self distancing and they were feeling very vulnerable. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that up. I think those personal stories as part of our off-campus life newsletters have a, a, a huge impact. So those are some of the ideas, but thank you for that question. Councilor Shannon, or I'm sorry, Councilor Hightower, are you all set? Yes, thank you. Okay, Councilor Shannon. Thank you, President Tracy. Um, and thank you both Gail and Bill for, um, for the presentation, but also for your work too, because we're reinventing a new wheel here. And I appreciate all the effort that has gone into that. Um, I have a question about, you know, I understand you have surveyed students. I don't understand how you're tracking students. It seems like we are going into a mode of um, contact tracing and, um, and we have a quarantine order. So I'm wondering if UVM knows where they're off campus students are, and if you know on an individual basis who is coming from where, where they're residing, and have the ability to make that inter, you know, individual intervention to talk about um, the things that, that you presented, that it's our expectation um, and it's the law that they comply with. Thank you, Councilor Shannon. Um, one of the things that we've done in our survey, we ask students where they're living and uh, we get the, what we kind of know uh, historically is the areas where they're, they're it's most prominent. So that's around the Loomis Street area and then the other is around Buell and Bradley. So we have those addresses. Um, we also, Lynn, Lisa Kingsbury from Campus Planning Services, she also does a survey every year to see where students are living and we share that information. So we have a pretty good idea. That's why when we did uh, the spring move out alternate project, we knew which neighborhoods to go into. So that, that's one thing. Um, most of our students are coming in from out of state and most of them are from Massachusetts and New York. So I think uh, we, do need to move into how does that look for con a, a contact tracing um, approach. And so I will bring that information back from this conversation to, uh, to people that are looking at both the testing and the contact tracing. Can I continue? Yes. Um, that sounds to me like the answer is no. We don't know where they are on an individual basis. We do know probably all of us and particularly people who live in the neighborhoods know which houses are student houses, um, which neighborhoods are student neighborhoods, but we do not know which students are living where and where they have come from. Is that correct? It is. In fact, when I have a, um, a call or a case and somebody doesn't have a name, I usually have to go knock on the door. We are trying, we've done a much better job in our registration when students have to sign up for registration of getting their local address. So we can look into the, um, to the local address database and see uh, what the addresses are there. We can't provide where individuals are living because of their, because of their FERPA protection, but we can tell you the, the numbers of students that might be in different neighborhoods, for example. And Lisa Kingsbury again has that information. Well, I'm not necessarily looking for you to provide it to us. I mean, it would only need to be provided to us if you wanted our help in working with those students. But I think that it's important for, for the university to know where they are and for the university to be doing the work to make sure that they are compliant. 
Um, so I hope that that is going to happen. It's getting kind of late in the game for that to happen. Well, uh, we already do that through, as I mentioned, changes in the way that we do registration. So when students register for classes, we will have their local address. Before we had trouble with students not providing the correct local address, sometimes it was their home state or their on-campus address. And now uh, that's, that's significantly improved. When do they register for classes? Uh, the first year students, I'm trying to think of when that comes up. I know it's in June but I don't have the exact dates. But haven't students registered for classes already? Upperclassmen? No, uh, no, our, our, a uh, orientation I know is coming up for registration. I'll, I'll check that, Joan, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Councilor Shannon. It is 7.32, so I'm gonna ask that we go into our public forum. Gail, are, uh, Gail and Bill, are you able to stay on um, for after the public forum? Is that okay? Yes. It is a time certain, so we do really need to get to that. Um, I have Councillor Carpenter and Freeman still in the queue. Um, are there others that want to get in the queue? Councilor I can Dina. email my question to Gail. Okay. Uh, that's perfectly fine. I want to welcome all questions. We'll come back into this um, this item. I want to make sure that everyone gets their questions because I know th this is an is issue of great interest to the community right now. So um, with that, we'll recess this item with the idea to come back after public forum. Um, if I could please ask uh, City Clerk Bovey to help with the public forum uh, in just a second here. But if you are interested in joining the public forum, I would just ask that you, um, so if you haven't already, submit your submit an email to publicforum at burlingtonvt.gov. That's publicforum at burlingtonvt.gov, and we'll um, get you in the queue to speak on the public forum. Looks like we have quite a few folks already signed up, so. Um, City Clerk Bovey, can you please call the, the first speaker for this evening? Yes, our first speaker tonight will be Robert Kiernan. Um, Robert, you should be able to go ahead. We can please get the, um, the timer up. We'll wait, let's wait till we get the timer up just so that folks can see that. And um, we're gonna have a, that on the shared screen. Chief of Staff Rodell, are you able to get that um, that timer up on the uh, the screen for us? Sorry, President Tracy, this is Olivia. Um, oh, Amy's got it. Great. Yep, I can do that. Um, I was actually thinking we, I, from what I've heard, we have quite a few folks in public forum uh, this evening and a very packed agenda. So I was going to set the time at two minutes this evening. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay, is Mr. Mr. Can you reset that and then make sure that we have uh, Mr. Kiernan online? Yes. I'm here. Have you got me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks for the public forum tonight. Uh, for your consideration tonight, uh, the proposed resolution to issue a city council COVID-19 emergency order to require wearing face covering in retail stores is appropriate and will hopefully receive strong affirmative support. Thank you, Councilor Shannon, for developing this resolution. Uh, many Burlingtonians are hoping to see city council action as well towards the recent efforts by the Burlington and actually statewide restaurant industry asking for community support and development towards their workers and for the economic contribution this industry provides to our city. Their petition to save Vermont restaurants has received well over 5,700 signatures as of today. Uh, I'm also reminded of last year's council deliberations about the downtown business district improvement plan that was comprehensive but was not approved in 2019. Uh, this is a timely concept to reemerge now to support the needed regrowth of Burlington economic health. My statement would be that a spirit of innovative planning should prevail during a time that sees the COVID-19 pandemic 
creating numerous economic and cultural cha challenges. In contrast, agenda item 7.07 .07 brings forward a council resolution directing city departments to provide resources and significant spending to tear down, store, and hide a mural that seems to be disliked by some in our community. And to do this over two years ahead of schedule that was agreed upon in October, 2018. This new resolution is not in the public interest in my opinion, especially during a time when city finances are severely challenged and there are current health and economic concerns of a much higher priority in our city and state. As an example- Please, please wrap up. Sorry, say again? Please wrap up. Okay, I'm wrapped up. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you very much. Who's our next speaker? Our next speaker is um, Sarah Scortino. Um, give me one moment and I will enable your microphone. Okay, Sarah, you should be good to go. Sarah, are you with us? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, thank okay. you. Great. Um, well, thank you for having me. I'm just here to speak in support of Councillor Hansen's resolution to move Berlin buildings in Burlington off of natural gas and towards renewable energy. I'm an environmental studies student at UVM and a leader in the movement to divest UVM's endowment from fossil fuels. Um, I really chose to come here because of what seemed like a commitment to environmentalism and uh, I was upset to be let down by the reality of our irresponsible and hypocritical investments. As a student who's really passionate about the environment, I feel similar reservations about living in a city still partially relying on fossil fuels, including natural gas, while I try to work towards a better future. Um, I'll be a tenant in Burlington in two short weeks and will be begrud begrudgingly making monthly payments to Vermont Gas, and this does not make me feel very proud to be a Burlington resident. I know the same goes for my peers, and. Um, yeah, I just feel ashamed to be going to a green school that's funding the fossil fuel industry and to soon be relying on natural gas in um, my apartment, which is an unsustainable and carbon intensive and inequitable energy source. I wonder when do the lies stop? When will the institutions that I support and the cities in which I live actually live up to the narrative that they promote? This resolution is an essential step towards making Burlington truly green. Strides have been made, but renewable energy is essential in order to address the climate crisis. And as a city largely led by progressives, we have the potential to lead in the way, to lead the way in efforts towards greening urban areas. Therefore, we really do have the responsibility to do so. And this includes the essential task of switching to renewable energy in all sectors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Our next speaker will be um, Evan Litwin. Um, Evan, you should be able to go ahead. Evan, are you with us? Are you able to hear me now? Yes, if you could please Great. set the clock one second, Evan. We just get that clock reset. Okay, perfect. Go ahead, Evan. Hi, good evening. Uh, tonight you have a proposal before you to change the number of units at the Cambrian Rise Development Project by over 23% from 770 to 950. After all is said and done, roughly four to 5% of Burlington's entire population will be living on this single 21 acre parcel of land. Additionally, its only entrance and exit point will be via North Avenue. My concerns tonight are more about process, system, and transparency than about anything specific to the proposal, although concerns certainly exist, including the one about increasing the height of the buildings. Assumptions that the height increases will be, as the memo states, little noticed by the general public, assumes consultation that hasn't happened. 
75 feet above grade means that the existing four-story buildings that now that people now live in could potentially be in the shadow of six or seven story buildings, perhaps eight when slope is taken into account. My concern lays with the rushed and discreet nature of the new proposal. The public uh, through our elected body is being asked to consider. The memo while referencing working closely with Mayor Weinberger for several months was only dated April 23rd during the height of the coronavirus situation. Um, residents have had little or no notice or opportunity and I am just uh, to address this. I'm just going to jump ahead for time. <clears throat> Therefore, uh, I see this as a critical moment for the identity of the new progressive led council to set the standard for community input, transparency and dialogue with the city's developer community. What might have been acceptable under the former council may not be today. Therefore, I ask that the committee either reject this proposal or allow Mr. Farrell to withdraw it until such a time that community input, feedback, and reasonable participation can be garnered by the council and any other appropriate entities. And I will leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker. Our next speaker will be uh, Nico Ozeki. Um, just one second. And you should be able to speak now. You'll just need to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name's Mieko Zeki. I'm the market director for the Burlington Farmers Market. I just wanted to provide a quick update about running the farmers market. Um, this year is our 40th season, and we are operating on starting on June 6th and going until October 17th. We have shortened our season dramatically due to COVID-19 and have dramatically um, changed our setup in light of uh, the farmer's market guidelines from the Vermont Agency of Agriculture um, to provide a, lot, a safe food hub as well as a shopping experience for um, Burlington residents and those who are visiting the Burlington farmer's market in general. Um, and so one of the quick things we want, I wanted to kind of give an up, uh, kind of our biggest concern is for us and under the um, for Agency of, of Agriculture's guidelines, we as staff, as well as vendors are all required to wear, wear facial coverings and gloves and knowing that there is a measure that is out there in regards to retail shops having uh, facial coverings and, and gloves, uh, we would, and, and particularly to, sorry, for customers, we would like to see the same extended to events like ours, since we are a recurring event that is going to be happening over a period of 20 weeks for the safety of our own vendors, as well as staff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker. Um, so I just wanted to say, I have someone named Norman Fisher who signed up. Um, I don't see you on the Zoom call. So if you could just email public forum and let me know how to identify you, we'll get you in queue. Um, but next, while we're waiting, I will um, we'll move to Trav Fryer. Um, Trav, you should be able to speak. Okay, you hear me? Yes, Trav, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, Trav, I'm a resident of the Old North End. Um, I just wanted to voice my support for Jack Hansen's resolution to help move Burlington off of fossil fuels. Um, it's a really small but necessary step, and I thank everyone for supporting it. Um, that's really all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker will be Jeff Nick. Um, Jeff, you should be able to go ahead. Jeff, do we have you on the line? Can you hear me? Yep, go right ahead. Okay, hi everybody. Um, Jeff Nick here, I'm the uh, chair of the Church Street Marketplace Commission. And I'd just like to comment on a couple of the ag agenda items tonight. Uh, first of all, um, it is our hope, the commissions, that uh, the positive business climate we all enjoyed a few months ago bounces back quickly, but uh, we certainly have our work cut out for us. With uh, We're now up to eight vacancies on the street, which is very concerning, and we know more, more will come. So our focus, the Marketplace Commission, is ensuring that uh, shoppers and visitors alike uh, are comfortable venturing back downtown in this new era of social distancing. It's very important. 
Um, we know there's going to be some apprehension and we must do everything we can to really eliminate that and, uh, and uh, make sure everybody feels safe uh, venturing back downtown. So uh, to that, uh, the Marketplace Commission voted unanimously to support Councillor Sharon's uh, efforts to require masks to be worn uh, while shopping. And um, the retailers I've talked to also appreciate that and uh, support it. So I think on balance, the uh, folks visiting Church Street will, uh, will uh, appreciate the effort. And uh, on a quick trip downtown today or walking on Church Street, I would say 90% of the people already had masks either on or in their hands. So I think the shoppers are, are ready for this and appreciate it. Um, the other item I'd like to comment on is the idea to remove the mural. And there's many reasons that mural was put in place and it's enjoyed by many. Um, but uh, there are the unintended consequences of what will happen without a plan to uh, replace that mural. And I think it's pretty evident to all of us now that uh, that wall would just become an alleyway of graffiti if that um, is, is removed and not replaced with anything. Uh, so we really hope that you would reconsider the implications of removing that mural. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, next speaker. Again, folks, if you're interested in speaking, you can email uh, publicforum at burlingtonvt.gov. It looks like we've tracked down Norman Fisher. I will go ahead and allow you to speak. Yeah, my daughter is the text expert. and She was the one who set me up on this. So anyway, I, I'm, I'm on now. Um, I, I believe that the, uh, I'm opposed to moving the mural, but particularly with, it, with COVID-19, I regard it as a reckless and dangerous action. Um, particularly in the light of two things. First of all, the deceptive and weak, weak intellectual basis of the report. And second, the failure to ever bring in the issue of free speech. On the first, I was involved. Uh, I, I tried to get on the panel, but I didn't. Okay, so they, they didn't get me on. But I, I came to a number of the meetings and I was struck by the fact that uh, the two of us who knew a lot about art history, I'm a retired uh, professor of, of philosophy, we're not on. Okay, that's, that's one thing. Maybe, the, maybe that's nothing. But the, the, most of the people, five out of the seven people on the panel, seem to be just they, they gung ho on getting rid of the mural. Uh, but even more serious than that is that at the July 31st meeting, um, Gary B. Carolis, who didn't want to get rid of it, wanted to have a motion, and the chair of the of the of the meeting uh, didn't allow him to have a motion. And when the thing finally went into the report, it was not signed. Uh, there's no way of knowing how many of the people on the panel, the seven people, actually supported the motion to get rid of it. Carolis didn't. I suspect that at least five did, but this is a conceptual problem, okay? It's deceptive and also the, the weak intellectual uh, uh, background to this suggests that people on the council should look at all the, the all this is on the record. Second point, which I've spoken on uh, extensively in 18, fall of 18, uh, late summer of 18, is the total lack of discussion of free speech. And this is an Glaring contrast to what happened in those. Please wrap up your comments, sir. Yeah, well, this is a glaring contrast to what, what happened in LA and San Francisco. There was a rich discussion of free speech. Many leftists, which I am, uh, supported free speech and didn't want those murals taken down. So I hope that the council, before they vote on this reckless and dangerous uh, action, uh, look into this. Thank you. Our next speaker. So um, I'd also make an announcement. Um, I had a Brian Drewer signed up to speak, who I don't see on the call. So if you can Oh, so you were the one who got me on. Yeah. Ten seconds before you got on. Okay. 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 Well, look, I signed up. But in the meantime, let's move to Lori Fisher. I'm Lori, sorry, are you with Lori, Lori, are you with us? Uh, give me just one second. I'm not seeing Lori. So in the meantime, we'll move to Dale Tillotson. Dale, are you with us? 
This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. Can you all hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Dale. Thank you. Thank right, you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President, for taking my comments tonight. I will be addressing the issue of the mandatory masking up of customers in retail establishments. And I also hope the surrounding communities of Burlington take a look at this and also join into this. I would also like to thank in particular the mayor's office, Councillors Shannon, Paul, Jang, and Polino for responding to my messages on the issue. While every cough is not a COVID-19 cough, while every sneeze is not a COVID-19 sneeze, every cough or sneeze should be treated as one. And with the 20% of the people that I see that are not masked up, that puts our lives in danger. As I said, my unofficial but personal observations are that roughly 20% of customers are not masking up while visiting retail businesses. Simply said, those unmasked that cough, wheeze, or sneeze must be declared a hazard to my life and anyone else around. Enforcement will be a challenge for all, and I hope the city emphasizes that with our health officers for them to get out and observe what is happening and report back issues that need addressing. In closing, if a volunteer is needed to ask customers to mask up, I am your person. I will do the best of my ability to educate those that are ignorant or arrogant of the situation with subtle comments such as no mask, no service. Again, I thank you for your time. You have a busy agenda tonight. Good luck. Stay thank safe, you. stay healthy. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker will be uh, Charles Messing. Um, Charles, you should be able to speak. Hi. Hi, Charlie, we can hear you. Hi, Zoomers. <clears throat> um, that's Charlie, by the way. Okay, I got all kinds of things to say in only two minutes. Uh, Joan, that's great that you've been working on the masks and the safety. I really think we have to make it known to the new kids that it's not just something they can, you know, brush off, you know, toss a beer can or a Red Bull can over their shoulder, forget a mask. I mean, what's the difference? You know, they're trying to be jolly and I'm not being watched. I'm away from home now. Uh, we really do have to make sure people know what six feet is. I see every day people are too close. So um, I hope we can do something about that. Um, Pine Street, I am for the new street. I think it will be better, much better. Uh, City Place, I'm sure wondering what's going to happen with that. Uh, the mural, mm, I don't like the mural, but as you know, I don't like parades. Um, outside, outside, uh, it's going to get hot and people are going to want to be in air conditioned places. Recirculated air, recirculated water is exactly what the virus would like. And we have to remember that. We have to be very careful of anything like that. Opening things up means cleaning up a lot. Um, this must be really something. You get a new council and all of a sudden you're sailing the ship and here comes a storm. Pow! So uh, good luck. I couldn't do what you do. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Have a good evening. Thank you, you as well. Okay, our next speaker will be Tony Reddington. Um, Tony, you should be good to go. Tony, are you with us? Tony, are you with us? 
Tony, it looks like you do need to hit your unmute button. Tony, are you able to uh You able to hit that on mute button, Tony? Okay, well, why don't we go to the next speaker and if someone from uh, the clerk's office could please continue to work with uh, Tony Reddington uh, to get him on the line um, so that we can hear uh, uh, Tony speak, that would be wonderful. Um, and uh, let's get that next speaker going and then again, we'll come back to Tony. Sounds good. Um, our next speaker will be Tom Proctor. Um, Tom, you should be good to go. Tom, are you with us? Yes, good evening. Um, thank you for, uh, for letting me speak this evening. My name is Tom Proctor. I live in Ward 1 and I work at Rights and Democracy. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say this evening that I support Councillor Hanson's resolution to help move buildings in Burlington off of natural gas and towards renewable energy. I think it's a critical way we can move forward on addressing climate change. I also believe that everyone on the City Council believes in climate change and know that it is critical we address climate change in any way and every way that we can. One crucial way to address climate change is to end our reliance on fossil fuels and I believe this resolution is the first of many steps in which we can take to make this a reality in Burlington. So thank you, Councillor Hanson, for bringing this resolution forward. Thank you. We able to get Tony back on the line? Um, I can give it another try. I haven't heard from him, but um, Tony, you are unable to speak if you can unmute your microphone. Tony, are you with us? Okay, well, let's keep trying and let's move on to the next speaker. Okay, um, our next speaker will be Charles Simpson. Um, Charles, you should be able to speak. Okay, okay. got it. Uh, that sounds like Tony. Yes. Okay, let's go with Tony first and then we'll go to Charles. Uh, Tony, thank you for bearing with us, appreciate it. Um, you have two minutes, go right ahead. Yeah, the button, the button showed up when I hit it. Okay, uh, thank you, President Tracy. My name is Tony Reddington. I reside at 125 St. Paul Street, Ward 3. I speak on behalf of Pine Street Coalition. More than a year will have passed before our Pine Street lawsuit filed last June 6, uh, gets past the U.S. District Court door one of many unaddressed laws, policies, and plans, as well as changes on the ground detailed by Pine Street in 2018, environmental justice impacts on King Maple gets addressed only because of Pine Street action. Burlington's standard for street design is really the North Avenue corridor plan adopted in 2014. It features two pieces. One, uh, cycle track or protected bike lanes from top to bottom and roundabouts that cut inj injuries and fatalities 90% at key intersections. There's no need to restate the current parkway design contains not a single inch of sidewalk, not an inch of safer of separate and safe bikeway as required by Vermont's complete streets law and contained in our own plan PTV walk bike. No need to restate that track six traffic signals compared to the basic roundabout spews out a yearly average of more than 3,500 gallons of gas and global heating emissions. No need to restate our largest waterway Englesby Brook jammed into a football field length of pipe. Restate, no, re, no reason to restate. Mayor Clavel fought uh, uh, the heart, uh, fought through uh, the, and against the, the, uh, the design that brings 29 to 37% more traffic to the heart of low income minority King Maple neighborhood where 30% have no access to a car. In sum, we believe that New Street, which we distributed for the first time this weekend to the council is a way in which the city, the city uh, those who are opposed to the current design, the Federal Highway Administration and Vermont Tran V Trans can come together 
with minimal changes in, in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the environmental documents and permitting to get a street that the, our city and our South End can, lit, can enjoy. And please, please wrap up. And the wrap up is off the wall. Thanks, Councilor. Thank you. Um, do we have uh, Charles Simpson? Um, Charles, you should be able to speak now. Okay, very good. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Charles Simpson, a resident of Ward 6 with some academic background in urban planning. Um, the Champlain Parkway as presently envisioned by DPW is a legacy project rooted in traffic and mobility assumptions, decade old and now thoroughly outmoded. Rather than being truly multimodal, it adds not a single foot of separate bike walk paths and actually removes some existing sidewalks. A time when we must stimulate local manufacturing and jobs, this roadway design squanders six acres of industrial potential of the enterprise district by slicing it open with a limited access highway. As we worry about climate change, it impedes preparation for floods by submerging Anglesby's Brook in a 200 foot culvert that restricts its ability to absorb storm water. And it barricades Pine Street on the border with South Burlington, frustrating connectivity standards. When a consensus is growing to reduce off street, off street parking requirements in the city core to make our city more pedestrian friendly, why build a new limited access Parkway, whose purpose is to funnel yet more traffic downtown. We're lucky that Burlington is a city in which citizens are deeply involved in public processes. The city, the Pine Street Coalition, a group of 200 residents, as Tony just indicated, um, has developed an alternative plan, and we recommend that uh, to you. It, uh, uh, I'm watching the clock here as well here. Okay, so I request that the Parkway project be referred to the Transportation, Energy and Utilities Committee for further analysis and public comment, including a discussion of the, of the coalition's new street proposal. This is the best forum for a full discussion of the question. And if I, I guess I, okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Me, you're on mute. Our next speaker will be Joanna Rankin. Um, Joanna, you should be good to go. Can you hear me? Yes, Joanna. Thank you very much for taking my comments this evening. And um, we've talked uh, over the years, over many years, almost two decades, about noise measurement and tracking equipment for the Burlington Airport. It's the only way we'll have an objective measure of the of the loudness of the aircraft that are using the, the airport. And um, I just wanna to report tonight that, that some of us have talked to Robert Duquette, who's the FAA Northeast uh, New England representative. He's looked at the, at the um, noise uh, studies from the last two decades. And he says that there's absolutely no reason why Burlington cannot apply for an FAA grant to fund noise measurement and tracking at the airport, which would give us an objective measure of the, of the levels of noise and their health and other kinds of, dis, uh, of effects on the community. So I ask the council to, to uh, encourage or, uh, or instruct the airport management to uh, to submit a grant, it has to be done quite quickly because the the deadline has been extended this year due due to COVID. But the deadline is within two weeks. So I mean, it's in, it's in mid June. So um, kindly uh, uh, start the process to uh, submit this FAA grant. Thank you very kindly. Good evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Graham Turk. Uh, Graham, you should be all set. Yep, can you hear me okay? Yep, go ahead, Graham. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna speak in favor of Councilor Hansen's resolution to help move buildings in Burlington off natural gas. Um, I think first we, uh, we know that ducted heat pumps can meet the need 
for Vermont winters. Um, using Burlington's 100% renewable electricity supply, efficient electric heat will drastically cut emissions. This will also keep money in the city and apply downward rate pressure by spreading Burlington Electric's fixed cost over higher sales. And this has an awesome flywheel effect because more electrification means lower rates, which in turn means more favorable economics against fossil fuel alternatives. So the proposal I really see is saving Burlingtonians money in the long run, moving the city closer to net zero, and improving air quality by reducing point source emissions, which is truly a win-win-win. Um, it's an opportunity for the council to demonstrate its commitment to Burlington's net zero energy plan, because heating represents such a huge share of Burlington's emissions, and also may be an impetus for, um, for district energy from the McNeil plant, um, as that would be a, a clean alternative to the existing fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, just a quick comment on the Cambrian Rise proposal. I hope that if we're allowing more units, uh, we are also being vigilant on how that impacts transportation and not getting stuck on the old paradigm of subsidized parking. Um, and lastly, just wanted to thank all councilors and the mayor for your dedication and continued progress through the pandemic and jumping through hoops to allow public participation through Zoom. So thank you all. Thank you. Okay, uh, our next speaker will be Lisa Lax. Uh, Lisa, you should be all set. Okay. Um, so my name is Lisa Lax. I'm a 37 year resident of Ward 1 and I wanna thank the council for making it possible for us to speak tonight. Um, I want to speak in favor of Councillor Hansen's resolution to help move buildings in Burlington off of natural gas and towards renewable energy. The city government has begun some really exciting initiatives and plans towards reducing the effects of climate change with its net zero plan. And uh, Jack's resolution is a logical and necessary step towards meeting these goals. So that's all I have to do say. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if members of the public wanna get into the queue for public forum, again, emailing publicforum at burlingtonvt.gov is how you do that. Um, so we only have one more person signed up that I'm able to find. Um, I have sent out messages to Brian Drewer and Lori Smith. If you can contact me, we'll try and get you to a chance to speak. Um, but the last person I do have signed up is Mark Hughes. Um, Mark, you should be good to go. Mr. President, good evening. Good evening, Consul, and thank you for all your hard work that you've been doing in this unprecedented time. I just wanted to uh, just speak out uh, on behalf of the Racial Justice Alliance. We're fearful that there are some of us that are still left behind. Uh, Pre-COVID-19, uh, Black folks had an unemployment rate of about two times that of um, and also a median wealth of one thirteenth out of whites. And also many uh, were pre-unemployed with no benefits, underemployed, struggling to start businesses, uh, previously incarcerated or under the control of the, the uh, Department of Corrections, unbanked, and uh, many had no sufficient tax filing history. Uh, recently, the Center of Responsible Lending estimated that upwards of about 90% of businesses owned by people of color have not been or will not likely be uh, uh, eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program. So there's a lot of things that are happening. COVID-19 is definitely exacerbating all of those known racial disparities in housing and education, also obviously in employment, health services access, the justice system, everything that's, that was uh, clearly outlined in the Attorney General's and the Human Rights Commission's Act 54, uh, racial disparities uh, in state systems report and recommendations that's dated December of 2017. <clears throat> that wasn't enough, you know, we've got, you know, all kinds of challenges right on the health front right here as well. And I think that was documented uh, just very recently by the health department. So uh, all that to say this is, is there, there's still work to do and I'm, I stand at the ready uh, to work with you. I'm, I'm looking forward to working with the DEI folks as well as continuing working with the mayor, uh, as well as uh, Taisha uh, to, um, to bring to bear all of the power that we can to make sure that these challenges are resolved. In closing, I would just say, uh, that, you know, definitely thumbs up, Councillor Hansen on the buildings, uh, um, uh, build, taking the buildings off of natural gas. I think that's a, a, a great move and it's time to do it now. Uh, thank you, Councillor Shannon, for the mass business. Uh, those of us who are people of color, Please you know, wrap up. Um, in a precarious place with our health 
in this uh, virus, but also many of us, 80% of us are on the front line. And finally, uh, I'll just say the mural, yes, take it down, it's racist. And the Champlain Parkway, I think you should kick that over to the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee since it's an environmental justice issue. Please wrap thank, up. Thank you for your time, uh, Mr. President. Um, thank you, Council, for your work. Thank you. Um, City Clerk Bovier, or do we have any additional speakers that are waiting to get on or that we're still trying to identify? Um, I did hear from uh, Lori Smith that um, he would like to speak, but Lori, I can't identify you on the call. If you could reply to my email and let me know. I'm right here on the call. My name is on the screen. Oh, okay. there you go. Okay. And I prepared, I prepared for a three minute uh, comment. I will do it as fast as I can, but I hope I can get through it, please. Thank you very much. And we'll get that right up. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Laurie. Good evening. My name is Laurie Smith and I live in Queen City Park in South Burlington. I first want to thank all of you for your efforts towards managing our Queen City and your efforts to improve the quality of life for all who live, work, and recreate in the region. Lately, I've been following the efforts of the city to get the Champlain Parkway completed and the efforts of the Pine Street Coalition to improve the design of the project and ensure that what gets built is a model for transportation infrastructure in the 21st century and is in line with the climate emergency resolution adopted by the city council on 9-23-19 with reduced pavement, promotion of bike and pedestrian transportation and minimized environmental comp impact. I have been paying attention to this project for decades and have witnessed the struggles that have plagued its completion. After listening to the DPW Parkway presentation at last week's council meeting and listening to the legal conversations at the Pine Street Coalition meetings, it has become clear to me that there are major differences of opinion about what modifications can be made to the project design while maintaining the ability to construct the project in the near future. The Federal Highway Administration rescinded the record of decision for this project last October. That action has significant implications for the project and potentially creates an opportunity for the city to make alterations to the project design. Rescinding the rod also potentially opens the project to new levels of appeal when a new record of decision is filed, leaving the project exposed to the possibility of further extensive delays if the city and the Pine Street Coalition do not work together towards a settlement that can be accepted by all stakeholders, which would enable the project to move forward uncontested. I encourage the council to consider briefly continuing any decision to allocate further funds towards this project to provide the time needed to ensure clarity about what options are realistically available He's to improve up. and complete this project. If there's a viable alternative Let's go for it. At the very least, taking a short pause referring to the TUC would provide an opportunity to clearly assess the options. Please do this. And please take care of traffic calming to get the problems relieved for the people that live in the South End. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. OK. Uh, City Clerk Bovey, do we have anyone else in the queue or trying to get on? I did just get a couple more emails. Um, next up, we have Alex Binzen. Um, Alex, you should be all set. Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Alex. I live in the Old North End. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm here to voice my support of Councillor Hansen's resolution to move Burlington buildings towards renewable heating. According to the Net Zero Energy Roadmap, heating accounts for almost half of total emissions in the city. Sustainable heating technology is available at affordable prices, and now is the time to move ahead. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you for that. And then. And last up, I had uh, Michael Mullen contact me, but Michael, I don't see your name on my list. Um, last. If you can tell me what you're logged in under, um, I can let you speak. And that's the last person I have signed up. Give a moment to, to try and get that.
anything, City Clerk Bovey? I haven't heard back from him and I'm still not seeing anyone listed under the name Michael Mullen. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and um, close that item. Um, in we will go back into um, the uh, the presentation um, from UVM and Gail Champ Noise. So in the queue, I had Councilors Carpenter, Freeman, and then Jang. So, Councillor Carpenter, the floor is yours. Um, this is really just a quick question. I, for some reason, I've had two families contact me today about their children who are moving from one apartment to another apartment in the city of Burlington. They've got, and the problem is they're going to be without house for three to five days while the landlords um, sanitize and fix the apartments. Typically, they go home or bunk up with a friend, but they can't do that in the stay-at-home thing. So I'm just asking, Gail, what options are you? Do you have any supports for those kind of residents? And I also just noted that um, in your flyer, the, it says the hotels are not open until the 15th, but I thought they were open on the 22nd. For your question, uh, and was that the uh, you about special edition? Because that was uh, May 11th. Yeah, I can't. It was the one that was sent to us. I don't know what tradition it was. Okay. So after that went out, then the governor's orders, uh, there was a letter that went out to the hospitality community. And so one of the things that changed is if you are a Vermonter, which these students are that are in between mm -hmm. housing, that you would be able to go stay and lodge after May 27th. I think that that was it May yep. 22nd. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so we've uh, we've uh, given that information to our students, so that could be one resource for them. We also said I know that a lot of our students don't have jobs anymore and are suffering as many of us economically. Um, so the student financial services uh, will uh, just call them and try to work out if there's any care money that could cover their situation as long as they reach the um, criteria for financial aid. Money, money is available, so that's the other information that we give them and what you just said also showed up in our survey when we asked students what else they wanted to say about their off-campus situation so some of them are using uh, storage and as you said uh, finding other places to live in the meantime but it has been very difficult is that all councilor carpenter okay councilor freeman Thank you, President Tracy. Um, and I, my internet um, did cut out in the beginning of your presentation. So if any of these questions are, I just have two questions, um, are repeat, just, um, I can just let me know and I can take it offline and we can follow up afterward. Um, but yeah, I appreciate the presentation, you both coming and speaking tonight. Um, I was curious if um, there's, is there any regulation around the sanitization of the units that folks are moving in and out of? I, and again, if I missed this because it was already part of the presentation, just let me know. No, it's not. Uh, well, the regulation is basically from uh, the Vermont statutes for essential maintenance practices. That's not specific to COVID related, but it has to do with lead paint. So buildings that are pre-1978 require a specific cleaning between tenants. Um, that's part of why a lot of the leases end of several days before the first of the, the month to give time for property owners to do that. Uh, but there are the current uh, CDC and health department guidelines for cleaning residential properties that would be in effect, but not uh, specific Burlington regulations. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess that kind of gets at my follow, like a follow-up question to that, which is just, you know, I, 
if, so it sounds like some, based on some regulations, some will be sanitized, but not necessarily. So you're saying all of them will be because of the CDC or, I mean, I understand well, there's they, also the whole it, but. Well, they should be. And I, that's part of the reason why we have a code enforcement office. The Division of Permitting Inspections handles complaints from uh, renters who get to an apartment that's not clean. We get those on a typical year. We can get calls, um, you know, anywhere from June 1st up to, um, you know, sometime in uh, August that someone's moved back in, there's no one there, and the place wasn't clean before someone comes in. So if someone asks you that question, by all means, have them call us um, at the, you know, the, the um, permitting inspections department. That's why we have deputy health officers to go out and do inspections of those properties. If they're not properly cleaned, our inspectors would uh, first, we'd ask for voluntary cooperation from property owners, but we issue written orders to the property owner to uh, have them corrected and brought back into compliance. And part of that goes from the inspection. So we would, uh, again, be the point of contact. It's a city staff, and there are five of us that can handle those types of complaints. I don't expect we'll have too many based on what I saw this weekend. There's quite a few cleaning crews out with property owners, <clears throat> but if you do have those issues, by all means, definitely have your um, constituents contact our office because we can help. Okay, thank you. And yeah, my so then my just the I understand that the city is able to regulate some of this, but also some of it is going to fall would probably fall on the state. Or if we needed to have increased regulation, is there been any? need to communicate with the state in any sort of increased sort of process that they're looking at in terms of regulating this period i am i am just sort of generally worried about the, the contaminants because of the amount of turnover um not just with student move out but just the the um, least turnover uh, major yeah i think the state's probably going to be limited to just providing guidance i don't believe they have the capacity to do on-site inspections or follow-ups. That's why I definitely would encourage anyone who has a question to call us because we're the resource in Burlington. Yeah, um, not just specifically towards inspection, but just sort of in general. I know during some of the early initial conversations, like, you know, we realized that you couldn't outright prohibit anyone from moving, but I just, I, I'm, I've been trying to reach out to the state to understand because I think Burlington is in a unique position being a municipality, um, having this level of high density and having this huge lease turnover to be um, in a position to be more vulnerable during this time. And um, I don't know if, um, you know, I, I'm happy to also follow up with the administration or just sort of folks in general, but I was just sort of, I've been looking to sort of tease out this aspect of, um, yeah, what this means going forward generally. That's part of what we're doing with um being out there because sometimes people aren't familiar with what our resources are, but part of my surveying people who are moving out this weekend was to do exactly that, to make sure they're aware of our resources and that we are available. Those are perfect opportunities. When someone does have a problem, they would let us walk right into the rental unit and we'll be there when folks are moving back in too for those types of things, walking through the neighborhoods. And so again, whether it's a call to us or while we're out checking in with folks, we will be available to check individual apartments. If folks have a question, um, or, and, and you can also reach out to me directly, we can follow up this conversation afterwards as well. Okay, yeah. Thank you sure. so much, Bill and, and Gail, for, um, for your presentation. I super appreciate it. Thank you, Thank Councilor you. Freeman. Um, and uh, Code Enforcement Director Ward, are you able to just share that? You said give a, give us a call or the contact information. Can you just reiterate that contact information for the public? Sure, 863-0442 is our uh, uh, office line. Um, but I think a lot of folks have my direct contact, both my desk phone and my cell phone, because it's listed because I'm Burlington's health officer through the Vermont Department of Health. Uh, we get a lot of direct referrals that way, and we have our administrators uh, check in with a staff member to make sure they're available. We assign uh, our team of inspectors so that we try to share the wealth and don't overwhelm any one individual, uh, particularly myself. I get those calls because my a variety of different numbers are out there, but the office number is the most direct way. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, so, sure. Councillor Jang, let me know that uh, 
that he has passed uh, on his thing. So the queue is currently empty. Are there any other counselors wishing to ask questions? Councilor Stromberg, go ahead. Yep, just a clarifying thing. And I'm more than happy to take this offline with you, uh, Bill. And it's also nice to meet you. Um, so cleaning is one thing and disinfecting is another. So Perry's question kind of brought this up for me mentally. If you walk into a place, it might be clean, but how do you know if it's been like properly disinfected and how are we enforcing that in terms of the turnover? The best way, I would say first, using their own senses as a renter moves into a place and often they know immediately, their, their senses say something's not right, that the next best, if whether they think it's clean or, or you know, if it's been sanitized, asking, right? Asking the landlord what process was uh, followed to make the place ready for the move in. But again, typically people can use their own judgment. And when someone says, oh, we've gone top to bottom, everything's clean. And you can look within a short distance of where you're at and you can see that that's not the case, then you can probably distrust the rest of the things that are being said. It's probably not clean top to bottom. That's a perfect call for us because it's also not just during COVID times, most of our homes are older. So if the horizontal surfaces have not been cleaned, there's a greater hazard related from the dust particles that they are from the lead paint. So uh, we get those calls, we, we expect some of those, but again, I think people using their best common sense and judgment when they walk in, if it doesn't look clean, it's probably not sanitized, but asking the property owner or property manager who's turning the keys over, what steps did you take to sanitize? And we can make sure, I'm pretty sure they're available on the website, but um, definitely folks can check them uh, either through the CDC or the Vermont Department of Health, but we'll make them available through our departmental uh, website as well. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other counselors wishing to ask questions on this item? Seeing none, we will go ahead and close this item. Thank you, uh, both of you, for, for being here and sharing this important information. Uh, I'm sure that should uh, others have questions that come up, um, please feel free, I would assume, to direct them to, to you, uh, recognizing that um, Gail is really here for the off-campus and that, as she said, if you have questions regarding sort of the on-campus and some of the fall-related uh, questions, that Joe Spidell is a good contact for you uh, in that regard. But thanks again for being here and for waiting through public forum as well to come back on to make sure all questions were answered. Hope you have a good night. Thank you for the invitation. Good night. Yep. Thank you. Good night. Okay. So that will move us into our next item, um, which is uh, climate emergency reports. Um, one thing that counselors reminded me about um, with these reports is that this is that there are not questions um, uh, with these. If you have questions just about something that someone says on their report, please follow up with them offline. So um, with that said, are there any um, counselors wishing to offer a climate emergency report? Counselor Hansen. Great, thanks. Yeah, just a couple things to flag. Um, so two of the resolutions that we passed in January, um, I just wanted to flag and follow up on. Um, there was a resolution um, around a study of, of air-free transit um, that was due back at, for this meeting. And obviously timetables are affected by COVID and um, city staff have been doing amazing work, you know, responding to the COVID crisis. So. Obviously, it's understandable that these timelines haven't been met, but I do want to just flag them so that um, as city staff are kind of returning back to some of the non-COVID work that, that this is flagged um, and, and for the public as well. Um, there was a, so the fair free transit study was one, and then uh, there was a resolution about using parking revenue um, to, to support alternative transportation. That was actually due back in in March as well. Um, and then one other one other thing to flag is um, the issue of rent weatherization that got rolling all the way back last summer. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The issue of rental weatherization that began all the way last summer. The idea of mandating um, landlords to weatherize rental units. That issue is going to be coming back after a bit of a hiatus, and that will be coming back in ordinance committee when we meet on 
on June 3rd. So looking forward to that and just wanted to flag that for folks. Thank you, Councillor Hanson. Other councillors looking to offer a climate emergency report. Okay, seeing none, we will go into our next item, which is the consent agenda. Is there an, a, a motion on the consent agenda? Councillor Stromberg. All You're right, ready. so I move. <laughs> All right, I move to amend, adopt um, consent agenda, taking the actions as indicated. No written material for agenda item 6.10, communication Catherine Shad, CAO, regarding calendar for fiscal year 21 budget process per CAO Shad. Um, add to the agenda item 6.13, communication Sarah Denny, regarding requiring masks in stores. Add to the agenda item 6.14, communication Mary Campbell, uh, reg uh, regarding require masks on customers shopping in 05401. Um, add to the agenda item 6.15 communication Martha Day regarding customers wearing masks in re retail stores. Add to the agenda item 6.16 communication Maya Campbell uh, regarding COVID retail response. Add to the agenda item 6.17 communication Kathy Rulo. Uh, regarding vote on mask mandate in stores, add to the agenda item 6.18, communication Carl and Ellie Potter regarding retail customer masks. Thank you, we have a motion, is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Paul, any discussion? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Is there any, any opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll now move into our deliberative agenda and item 7.01, uh, which is a uh, communication, um, but also uh, there is action requested. So if we could um, please have a motion on the um, item 7.01. Councilor Mason. Thank you, President Tracy. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'd like to make a motion to authorize the Director of Public Works to execute contract amendment number 16 to the contract with Clow Haber and Associates, Harbor, excuse me, and Associates for engineering nine services for the Champlain Parkway project, increasing the total contract amount by 824,940.96 cents and the local match obligation by $16,498.82, subject to review and approval by the city attorney's office. And um, I don't need the floor back if there's a second. Okay, we have a motion seconded by <coughs> Councilor Paulino. Um, we'll go ahead and open up the floor to discussion. Well, actually, let's go to count to yeah. actually let's go to uh, Chief and Spencer and um, Director Spencer and City Engineer Baldwin um, for just a, a, a brief um, recap of what we're doing tonight. I'm going to turn it over to City Engineer Norm Baldwin is prepared to, to give remarks. Thank you, Chapin. Thank you, members of council, for this opportunity to speak. Uh, at the May 11th City Council meeting, the staff presented the project update. Obviously, there was new councilors to, to not familiar with the project, so it was important that we share that information and frame the project in its right context. The department has requested the Board of Finance and City Council, City Council to authorize execution of the contract amendment 16 that was referenced in the amounts that uh, Councilor Mason had suggested. There are additional tasks that are required to complete the, the National Environmental Policy Act for permitting to finalize the contract plans and bid documents and advertise the project for construction bidding. DPW anticipates the previously authorized contract funds will be fully expended by mid-May. Without an executed contract, the consultant or subconsultants will stop work on this project. Failure to execute a timely contract amendment to continue to advance this project will jeopardize the current funding sources. This project has a favorable cost sharing ratio of 95% federal, 3% state, 2% city local match compared to other recent grants, grants which are typically 80% federal and state, 20% city local match. Other than that, um, I believe that members of council had an interest in having this issue brought to the TUC and staff and the department supports that concept, but we really firmly believe that in order to avoid challenges in the future with our partners in this process, that we need to move ahead with this contract amendment 
in a timely manner. So with that, I'll be available to answer any questions. Thank you, City Engineer Baldwin. Um, I see Councillor Hightower and then Councillor Mason. Councillor Hightower, go ahead. I actually have a point of order first, um, which is I, sorry for not knowing Robert's rules quite as well. In order to refer this to Tuke, do we need to amend the motion or is that a separate motion? If we wanted to do both, sorry to clarify. So can, can, you, ex can you say a little bit more about what you're hoping to do? Yes, so I'm hoping to both authorize this as um, uh, moved by Councillor Mason, but then also to move some discussion of this to Tuke for a report back. I believe that that would be an amendment um, to the action. Um, so we, are you prepared to, is that correct, Attorney Blackwood? Yes. Okay, so, um, Councilor Hightower, are you prepared to offer an amendment? We can always come back to you if you'd like to um, form, take a moment to think about it. Oh, that would be fantastic, thank you. <laughs> okay, all right, I'll go to Councilor Mason for now and then we can come back to you after that. Go ahead, Councilor Mason. Okay, I would have questions about the amendment if that were made, but since that's not made, my question back to Mr. Baldwin relates to <clears throat> Norm, or you referred to, these additional expenses in order to compliance with NEPA. How much of this is being driven by the environmental justice um, review that or study and, and work that's scheduled to commence or is commenced, but it will be continuing over the next four months? Sorry for that, I've been on mute. So obviously there's a significant amount of effort that goes into continuing to complete the public process that's still outstanding and to complete the NEPA process. But it's it's an unpredicted thing in terms of how long this would take and what it would require. So we're giving our best guess, but certainly there are other there are other items that we are working through, but this is the most critical path item in itself. Thank you. Okay. Uh, council Councillor Hightower, are you prepared to offer your amendment now or do you want me to move on to other councillors? Sure, um, I would move to amend by saying that I would also like to, oh goodness, actually I don't know how to say this. <laughs> Give me another minute. <laughs> okay, are there other councillors who are interested in speaking? Councillor Pine and then Councillor Shannon, Councillor Pine. Sure. Um, I think that um, what uh, Councillor Hightower was um, was alluding to was essentially approving the contract um, extension or, or, or essentially the amendment to the contract and allowing for the new concept or the concept of changes to the to the project being discussed at the um, Transportation Energy and Utilities Committee. And if that were so, is is there anything in that process, in that sequence of events that creates concerns for, for the department in terms of just keeping this moving along in a somewhat orderly and predictable fashion. City Engineer Baldwin, are you prepared to answer that? Yeah, so we, we have no issue or problem with continuing to have a conversation at the TUC level about the project, but we really need to Get get these contract amendments executed. Otherwise, we we stand to be in kind of jeopardy of two things. One is obviously we made commitments to the council before we proceed with any work that we would have contracts in hand and completed and executed. The other is if we don't execute the contract and don't advance the work, then our partners at the federal and state level may consider this a, a not advancing the project in a timely manner and decide to to pull our funding and and that could be a risk. Councillor Pine, do you have further questions? Um, only to know that, um, I just wanna make sure that if we do, I, there hasn't been a proposal yet to refer, but I have a feeling we're about to hear one. So um, we will get into the detail of that a little bit more, but I just wanna make sure that staff, um, you know, the TUC is busy. If it doesn't happen until sometime in, in June, it doesn't sound like that's a problem. It sounds like what really would happen is the, committee would discuss the alternatives being advanced by um, folks like the Pine Street Coalition. I think that's the, 
gist of what I believe would uh, would occur at the committee level. Right. Does, and, does, yeah. yeah. But to give you a little kind of deeper understanding, I think many of the proposals that Pine Street Coalition are bringing up can be provided a response in terms of what the consequence of some of those decisions are, then the council can weigh those, but it, those are significant and would likely place the project at risk of, I guess, uh, being closed. Mm -hmm. And then you would have to restart a project that would be under a different funding resource, funding schedule. Thank you, that's helpful. That's it. Okay, thank you, Councillor Pine. I have Councillors Shannon, Hanson, and Freeman in the queue, and then I'll come back to the amendment, Councillor Hightower. Um, Councillor Shannon, go ahead. I was just going to offer an amendment, but I think if Councillor Hightower is ready, uh, I okay I'm to, to assist if you would like. Okay, fair enough. Councillor Hightower, are you ready? Um. Yeah, I would amend the motion to adopt the action and refer the issue of the parkway to Tuke for further review and information and would take it back after a second if possible. Okay, we have a motion to amend. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Shannon. Um, Councillor Hightower, you have the floor. Okay, and I apologize for that and thank you for helping on that language. Um, yes, I think it's just, I, I know that this has been through council many times. I don't wanna delay the action, which is why I would really like to authorize um, the execution of the contract amendment. At the same time, I think there's several new counselors on the issue of the parkway and it's a pretty complicated issue. I would like to have that larger conversation. Um, and I know that Chapin's made himself available, which I very much appreciate, but I'd like to have that larger conversation with some of the other counselors as part of a public process that's not necessarily taking up hours of um, of our time here. So I'd really appreciate the opportunity to go back and discuss some of the things as a new counselor um, with a more in-depth conversation than we can have here. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Um, we, I have Councillors Shannon, Hanson, and Freeman in the queue, but we do have an amendment discussion. I can come back to you or come to you, uh, Councillor Shannon, uh, if you would like to um, discuss the amendment. Um, your, your pleasure. No, I don't need to. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Hanson, you want to speak? Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> can you just repeat it? It's really hard for me to hear it and not see it. I'm so sorry. Absolutely, Councillor Hightower. Can you Councilor please? Councillor Hightower, I'm so sorry. No, not at all. I'd like to amend the motion to adopt the action and refer the issue of the parkway to Took for further review and information. Okay. Okay. Did everybody hear that? Okay, awesome. Okay, so we are on the discussion on the amendment. Um, I have Councillors Hansen and Freeman and the Q Councillor Hansen. Do you want to speak to the amendment? Sure, yeah. I, I think I think my one of my questions is related. Sorry, your mic. I yeah, I think at least one of my questions I believe is relevant to the amendment. Okay, go ahead. Um, so if we if we approve this contract, how far does that take us? Like how long does this extension go? Your your mic again, Councilor Hanson. If we extend this contract, how far would that take us? How far would that extension go of the contract, or is it, or how far do we expect that it would go? So our our intent with that is to arrive at a construction phase of construction. So so this sixteen dollars, this sixteen thousand dollars is enough to get us all the way to the construction phase. That's what. It, that's presumed. We don't know all the challenges that we'll face, but that's what we believe we'll arrive at. Okay. Yes. Got it. And what, what is the next step whereby which you all would be looking to the council for approval of something? I would assume it would be going to a stage of uh, getting the work and uh, going to award the work for construction. Okay. I should be check-ins along the way. It's not our so, intent to get to the, to the end without periodic check-ins. Point of order. Yes. 
So we're, we have an amendment on the floor. We're talking about the underlying motion. So I want to just raise that. Okay. These questions are all about the underlying, not the amendment. We have an amendment on the floor that we should be okay. debating. That is, a, that is an in order motion. Uh, Councilor Hanson, please just keep your comments specific to the amendment. I can come back to you once we get the amendment done. I'll hold off until after the amendment then. Okay. Um, Councilor Freeman, I had you in the queue. Um, you can speak to this or I can come back to you in the, the regular motion. Your pleasure. Um, my um, comment was to the underlying um, resolution. So I will um, keep my comments to that. Okay. Does anyone else like, would, would anyone else like to speak to the amendment? Okay. Uh, Councilor Paulino, then Councilor Mason. Councilor Paulino. Uh, I just have a question for, I think the city attorney, mostly about uh, procedure. And I have no problem with the amendment's intent. I just think that this issue is at Tuk. It always is at Tuk. We can ask uh, any city councilor, uh, Tuk uh, member can ask uh, Director Spencer and and just engineer Baldwin to do a presentation on the parkway. We usually only get those when there's been uh, significant changes and um, with some input from the administration usually as to sort of clarification direct and direction of the project so that we're not just having a, a meeting um, without sort of a, a goal in mind. Um, but I guess is, is this kind of, I see this as a request, monetary request for engaging in services, much like a board of finance uh, request. So is such an amendment moved? Doesn't the issue always lie with Tuke? Attorney Blackwood? Uh, no, the city council works by your committees. Um, your rules have said your committees take matters only when they're referred from the city council. So it, it's not out of order to um, refer, add something to referring a matter to the committee. Does that answer your question, Councilor Polino? Yes, thank you. Okay, Councillor Mason. Thank you, President Tracy. Um, my comment somewhat relates to the same. The language used in the amendment is to refer the parkway issue. Prior to the amendment being made, there, were, however, was specific reference to the proposed plan from Pine Street Coalition. So from my perspective, if I'm voting on two taking up the parkway, uh, the coalition's plan, my vote is no because I, we heard last week from my perspective that plan is dead on arrival and having to spend valuable time, I vote no. I don't know what the parkway issue means. So I'm not sure if it's possible from the maker to maybe clarify or if, um, if the intention is to keep it vague, then I'll have to make up my mind how to vote. Okay, Councillor uh, Shannon. <laughs> Thank you, President Tracy. Um, my, the, the amendment did not specifically, um, refer a new plan, but I know in my discussions with counselors, there's, there's been a lot of discussions about different things and, you know, where, where we might be able to make some tweaks to it and, and where we can't. And I think it's important for, um, the council to understand those parameters and I would welcome the Tuke kind of pushing on that and um, understanding where those parameters are, because I, I don't think that that is really obvious to people. And I know Councillor Mason and I have had the benefit of um, a, a really long history of being able to look at some some different options. And I think that we have been reasonably persuaded that we've pushed as far as we can on some important issues, but uh, not all the counselors at the table have had the opportunity to do that. And I think it's better to do that in committee than on the council floor. So for that reason, I will support sending this um, issue to the to the two committee and I hope that counselors that have questions will um, attend those meetings when when the committee takes it up. Thank you Councilor Shannon. Councilor Freeman was that a did you want to get in the queue? Okay. Councilor Carpenter. Um, I 
just like to agree with Councilor Shannon. I think a review of potential tweaks or why or why not we cannot do them in a public setting like a two hearing or a two meeting would just be helpful and informative um, so we can move on. And I think there's many reasons why some of the suggestions can't be done practically talk about it and move on. And maybe there's a few others that we could look at. I heard um, Spencer say there's gonna be the allowance for a few changes along the lines, but we don't wanna hold the project up. We just wanna understand it better. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Does anyone else, would anyone else like to speak to the, the amendment? Councillor Mason, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Pres uh, President Tracy. I mean, I, I will be voting no. I thought we covered this last week. The letter from the state that was made a public record was crystal clear that the only changes would be allowed with those that came out of the mitigation efforts relating to the EJ. So I respect um, we may have a difference of opinion, but from my perspective, this is an easy vote for me. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the amendment? Seeing none, we will go to a vote. Would the city clerk please call the roll? Councillor Carpenter. Aye. Councillor Jang? Yes. Councillor Freeman? Yes. Councillor Hansen? Yes. Councillor Hightower? Yes. Councillor Mason? No. Councillor Paul? Yes. Councillor Paulino? Yes. Councillor Pine? Yes. Councillor Shannon? Yes. Councillor Stromberg? Yes. City Council President Tracy? Yes. 11 ayes, one nay. That passes. So we are back to the original motion as amended. Uh, in the queue, I had Councillors Shannon, Hansen, and Freeman. Councillor Shannon, the floor is yours. If you want to get in the queue to speak to the main motion, please just let me know. I do not. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Hansen, I'll go back to you. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, this is, I mean, this is a scenario that I feel like is difficult on council where we're faced with sometimes decisions that feel like non-decisions or feel like we don't really have a choice because what we're being presented here is that if we, if we vote no, the city could be at risk of losing $14 million. And also, if we vote to spend more time on it, we could lose money due to con you know, outstanding payments that need to be made on, on work already done or contracts. So I guess just a comment or a request is that, and this isn't to put fault on anyone, but I think just going forward as much as we can try to have these decisions made at a point in time where there's actually more of a decision to be made and that we actually have the opportunity to, to make that decision without putting the city in financial risk. I think that would be very beneficial to, to try to get ahead of these decisions. So it's not, we're not so late in the game where by delaying it all or by saying no, we put the city at financial risk because that's a really tough place to be in as a city councilor. And especially for me, I'm in general, I'm very skeptical of this project and skeptical of it moving forward. But of course, I don't want to cast a vote that's going to make the city lose money. So it just it just puts it in a tough position. Um, so I just want to highlight that. But I do appreciate the fact that um, DPW has made themselves available to explain this complicated issue for those of us who don't have all the history and who are trying to keep up with a lot of very differing and, and strong opinions that we're hearing about the issue. Um, so my other, my other question, this was sort of already asked, but I, I wanna clarify um, from DPW. How, can you quantify at all how much of this particular extension is going towards the um, environmental justice efforts? I don't know if you can respond to that. I don't have that detail here with me. Uh, yes, Councillor. I don't have the 
dollar amount in front of me, um, but it is most of this work, um, which is most of the work that will be happening between now and when we bid for construction. Um, our consultants will help us with the outreach as well as uh, completing the environmental justice review. And the other portion of the work is just um, completing the bid documents and the final design. Okay, great. Well, that's that's helpful to understand, and that that makes me a little bit more comfortable with this particular vote. And do is there was a point raised in public comment by Mark Hughes about potentially involving the diversity, equity, inclusion committee, or perhaps involving the the DEI director, um, Taisha Green. Um, is there any plans for that? Uh, not, not at this point. We are working with our federal partners about following their process. Of NEPA, and we can certainly ask that question, but I think it's it's really in their court to decide how they want to proceed with this process. We're having to follow that process. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I think to the extent that we can keep those folks in the loop or involve them, um, I think that would be a good use of those that committee and, and that position. Um, as long as it doesn't obviously violate the federal process, I think it'd be good to um, include them. Um, so I guess, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm glad we were going to Tuke, and I think given how stacked the, how backed up and stacked the Tuke agenda is, this might need to be a separate meeting. So I'll just throw that out there. It might need to be its own, its own Tuke meeting. I'll just throw that out there for the chair and others to think about. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hansen. Councillor Freeman. Thank you, President Tracy. Um, my question was also a follow-up about the environmental justice portion, and I just um, was wondering if you could remind me about the process, and I think you basically just spoke towards it a little bit, but it is really just the process um, the federal um, sort of side is going through, and do we, I understand that we are basically providing information on, you know, locally, but I guess my question is like, are we, do we have any local process around that? And, and what kind of engagement does that entail with people who are then directly impacted? Um, and is that all just driven by um, the federal um, requirement? Well, certainly our intent is to not just do the minimum what federal, federal rules require. We are trying to meet or exceed those requirements. And we've done extensive amount of public engagement and we'll continue to do that and maybe more than what even the federal government will require. So we uh, are very trying to be very thoughtful about that. We're also, um, we are in a situation where the federal government rules change and over the years with the life of this project, along with the census data is updated until we're, we're trying to track and follow both obligations. while still trying to do what we think is appropriate to our community. Okay, yeah, that was helpful. And I, I didn't mean to imply that that we, that there was not a process. I just, you know, if it's being initiated initiated by, um, you know, the, the federal government, then um, I was just curious to hear sort of what we were, um, what we are planning on the local side. So yeah, I have a lot of lingering concerns about this project. Um, and um, I have a feeling I might be the only person so, so who plans Susan, to vote against it. So, so would it be helpful for Susan, maybe you explain maybe what we're proposing in terms of upcoming uh, public conversations that would be helpful to making uh, Council Freeman a little more comfortable about that? Yep, sure. Um, we have for previous outreach and the outreach going forward have been working with CEDO as well and relying on some of their resources to help us engage with the community. Uh, we've also been in contact with some of our community partners, including the King Street Youth Center, Burlington Housing, Champlain Housing, um, as another way of reaching out to the public. Um, upcoming, we do plan, uh, due to the current situation, to be hosting uh, more virtual and online resources uh, that will help to educate about the project and also uh, welcome more feedback. Right, because I would understand that some of this outreach has probably been pretty limited, like 
based on the timeline of when we were given the new stipulations in terms of the environmental sort of justice uh, component, so to speak. So, I mean, when I'm try, I'm just trying. Can you, Doug? When did that? Like, when would your outreach have started? And when did? When would you? When? When would have been the period of direct communication? I promise this will be at the end of my pretty much the end of my questions. I know we have a, a packed agenda tonight. Um, so we've previously, uh, back in September, we did host a public uh, neighborhood meeting uh, for the Maple and King Street neighborhood, um, as well as open house um, as part of those efforts in September and October. Um, those efforts included uh, translated meeting flyers and interpreters available. Um, our upcoming outreach, we anticipate uh, to be in uh, likely July uh, when we'll be doing another round Putting more materials out for the public. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Is that, okay, so we have, so next I have Councillor Shannon. Just want to note for folks that we are just at a little past nine. We still have six items on deliberative. So um, let's try and move ourselves towards a vote on this. Councillor Shannon. Thank you. I just wanted to um, note uh, Councillor Hansen had asked to get this information sooner, but um, in, in this case, I know that Director Spencer had told us not, not last week at his update, but in the one prior to that many months ago, that this was coming forward. And I don't know how much more of a heads up than that our staff can, can give us. I think that they have kept us apprised of that. And I would note that the previous administration and the previous director in 2010 came to, to the council and asked us to approve an amendment that covered all of the spending from 2006 to 2012. And that was retroactive and put us in a position where we could not vote no, because we were voting on reimbursing ourselves for years. And um, I very much appreciate that this administration has been proactive in bringing these amendments forward in a timely and a regular way. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. I don't have anyone else in the queue. Again, we do need to kind of move towards a decision on this. Are there any final points that councillors would like to make? Councillor Hansen, please, I've already spoken, yeah. so please kind of get us moving towards. Yeah, no, I'll be quick. I just want to clarify. I wasn't trying to criticize. Your mic. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly clarify. I wasn't trying to clear, I wasn't trying to criticize staff. I just think there's a timing issue where we're making it where we're making decisions sometimes on things where if we if we go one way, the city's losing money. And I, I think that as much as we can avoid that timing issue and be able to make decisions that are yes, no decisions where whether we vote yes or no, we're not causing the city to lose money as a result of that vote. Um, I don't know how difficult that is with the timing of contracts, but I think that's that's what I was getting at. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. All right, so any final remarks, Mr. Mayor? Is, are you trying to get in? Yeah, I, I just want to speak to the last point quickly <clears throat> and just make it clear that the, the, the reason that the city now needs to make a decision about whether to go forward with the project or to pay back millions of dollars is because time and again for decades, your predecessors made that decision and committed the city to go forward with the project, knowing that um, there would be consequence if there was a later change in mind. This is, this is the way that this agreement with the other partners has always worked. We are spending their money. There's always been an assurance that if we were to change our mind in the future about the need for the project, that that, ch that change would come with the consequence of having to repay the money. So I, it, I just want to make sure it's clear to, to everyone involved in this. It's not like the, these decisions haven't been made. It's that they've been made in the past and there are consequences to making those decisions in the past. So this was already the case and the city owed millions of dollars of repayment. By the time this administration started in 2012, we we're already many millions of dollars down this road, which is why so much effort has been made in recent years to improving the project Within the, within the limited boundaries of what was possible with the issue, with the, with the permits already having been issued by 2012. 
we have always since 2012 been working within the boundaries of a project that was already permitted and that you couldn't go back to square one. And that still remains the, the limitations of our decision making today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, anyone else? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to a vote. Would the city clerk please call the roll? Councillor Carpenter. You're muted, sir. Councillor Carpenter, I'm sorry. Aye. Councillor Jang? Yes. Councillor Freeman? No. Councillor Hansen? Yeah. Councillor Hansen. Can you just speak into your mic, please? Yes. Councillor Hightower? Yes. Councillor Mason? Yes. Councillor Paul? Yes. Councillor Paulino? Yes. Councillor Pine? Yes. Councillor Shannon? Yes. Councillor Strongberg? Yes. City Council President Tracy? Yes. 11 ayes, one nay. That passes, um, which brings us, thank you to our, the, to Director Spencer and City Engineer Baldwin for joining us for, and, and, uh, and uh, Engineer Malzahn, I appreciate that as well. Really appreciate all of you uh, coming us two weeks in a row to uh, present to us. Thank that you. brings us to item number 7.02, um, a ordinance on streets and sidewalks, excavation and obstruction permits. Um, is there a motion on that? Count Councilor Stromberg, go ahead. Uh-oh, I lost it, sorry. Someone else have it up and ready to offer a motion? Councilor Paulino, go ahead. So it's uh, a motion on item 7.02 um, to, um, I'm sorry, hold on. I thought I had it up. Um, Councilor Paul, go ahead. <laughs> Councilor Paul, do you have it? Yes, I'm fine with that. Um, so I'd like to make a motion to waive the second mm -hmm. reading and adopt the resolution, ad adopt the ordinance. Okay. I do not need the floor back after a second. Thank you. A uh, second from Councillor Mason. Um, any discussion on the uh, on this? Uh, well, actually, can we have a uh, a quick um, explanation of what it is this ordinance is before we go into to the um, any discussion on it? Um, Councillor Mason, go ahead. Uh, thank you, President Tracy. I'm sorry. I was waving before to get recognized to make the motion, realizing my video was off. So my apologies. Okay. Um, for the benefit of uh, the, the council, this is um, some minor amendments. These are updates that were brought forth by Department of Public Works, um, Caleb Mana, and the Public Works Commission. Um, they were intended to bring the insurance amounts up to, it had been, who knows the last time this had been updated, bring uh, insurance amounts for um, anyone doing work in our right of ways up to current standards. Also bring the fees in line with uh, 2020. There were also some language updates. Um, some of this language dated back 50, 70 years. Um, it came before the ordinance committee multiple times. We kept tasking Caleb with additional um, uh, things to update, not because there was anything wrong. This did come before the ordinance committee at our last ordinance, uh, our meeting and was unanimously adopted. So with that, open the floor for questions. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Thank you. Are there any questions with regards to this ordinance? Okay, seeing none, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the ordinance, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Hearing none, that passes unanimously which brings us to our thank you again to the, the team at DPW for again staying with us on that item and being there to answer questions. Next item is a public hearing uh, regarding uh, community development block grants and home uh, proposed allocations for 2019-2020 uh, action plans for housing and community development. Um, before I open the public hearing, I uh, just want to go to um, I believe that we're going to have um, some representatives from CEDO speak to that item. Um, then we will open that public hearing um, if anyone is interested in um, speaking to that uh, particular item. Again, you can email uh, 
public forum at burlingtonvt.gov. That's public forum at burlingtonvt.gov. So um, I'll turn it over to uh, Director McGowan um, from CETO to just explain um, what this is regarding. Thank you, Councillor Tracy. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, so I'm Luke McGowan. For those of you who haven't met, I'm the Director of CETO. Uh, I'm here to present our uh, plan for the deployment of CDBG dollars here in our community. Um, and so just before I jump into the presentation, you know, I'm gonna be uh, brief and clear, which doesn't always go together with HUD compliance issues, but I will do my best uh, to do this quickly. So just to step back for one minute for the new counselors who haven't had a chance to work with this program. So CDBG is a community development block grant. It comes through HUD, a federal agency, and it is meant for local communities. It's a funding source for local communities to address uh, the roots and consequences of poverty. Um, the city receives these block grants and then awards them uh, in two ways. One, to local organizations that are addressing those roots and consequences of poverty. And also the city operates its own CDBG funded programs. Here in Burlington, we have a a uh, very extensive and nationally recognized uh, process for bringing community feedback together with the city team and the council to make recommendations. Uh, namely, we have a public advisory board that reviews all of the projects and makes recommendations uh, to us. So what we're presenting to you is largely a set of recommendations that have been extensively uh, vetted by the community. Uh, so now if I can do this Quickly, I'm gonna share my screen and just run through a presentation. And just confirm folks can see my screen. Yep, we can, I can see it, yep. Great. Um, so what is happening this year is slightly different than in normal years. So we have uh, what is normal is we have a entitlement from 2020 and that's $765,000. That's effectively sort of last year's allocation of dollars. Uh, and that process has gone through this public advisory board and they have made recommendations to us on how to allocate those dollars. Uh, we also have in response to the crisis an additional $450,000 through the CARES Act, which was the federal response uh, to uh, the coronavirus, and it's to be used for response and recovery efforts in our community. We are now running through the timeline uh, in a pretty accelerated uh, way to get these dollars as quickly as possible into our community. So we've uh, run through our process with the advisory board, we've solicited input from CDNR, on uh, what we're proposing. We have now published our plan and we're in the middle of a public hearing to take input and commentary on our plan. Uh, we are targeting city council and board of finance approval on June 1st. And that would bring us to a submission to HUD by the 5th, which really puts us in range of having these dollars arrive in Burlington by the end of June at the earliest. So that's kind of pending HUD's process of seeing what comes from us and then approving that and letting us uh, start to fund these uh, projects. HUD has made some important changes. Uh, they've recognized kind of the urgency of getting these dollars into the community. Uh, so they've allowed us to hold virtual public hearings, which we're doing now. They've also allowed us to reduce the public comment period, which is normally uh, 30 days. We've reduced it to 15 days. They've also given us some additional flexibility. We have uh, uh, essentially evaluated two buckets of needs. One is those identified by the 2020 entitlement process. Uh, and that cost is there. That's that $765,000 amount. We've also identified new needs uh, as a result of the pandemic. And that those are namely rental assistance, small business relief, a low barrier shelter that is available year round, and additional food access funds. 
what we're proposing to all of you, uh, uh, to the council and to the community is to follow the advisory board recommendations for the 2020 entitlement funds. And we are also proposing to use the additional COVID funds essentially in two ways. We're splitting that amount uh, by 50% towards the rental assistance program, 50% towards a small business uh, support program that supports low and moderate income business owners and employees. Uh, what you're seeing here is essentially the recommendations uh, for the 2020 entitlement year. Uh, and these are divided into sort of two groups. One is for public service awards and the other is for development awards. And that you can see those development awards here. We also run city programs with these CDBG funds and you see those listed here. And mo most of these are long running city, front, uh, city programs. And this is just a little bit more detail about how we're breaking down the rental assistance and small business uh, assistance funds. And, um, you know, I kind of want to make a point that we're sort of using different funding sources to meet the many community needs that we have. We made the decision that uh, the CDBG funds were best suited for the rental assistance and small business assistance programs. And we'll be leaning on other sources of funds to sort of meet the other needs that we identified. Uh, I also want to say the kind of details of the programs are being crafted uh, as we speak. We're continuing to get new guidance from HUD. We're continuing to see changes in the state level program. Um, and we are incorporating those uh, design changes into what we, uh, what we um, kind of will finally present, you know, at the end of this process. What we're asking for now is input on our plan to essentially use these funds uh, in a high level way towards rental assistance and small business assistance. So I will end there. I'm sure uh, there are questions and I'm happy to um, take any. I'm joined by colleagues from CEDO, uh, Katie Kinstead and Todd Rawlings and Christine Curtis who have been working on this, uh, who have been doing great work on this so far. Um, but yeah, I will stop there and take any questions that there are and thank you. Okay, so if we could go out of um, share mode, please. Thank you. Um, okay, <laughs> I just want to recognize that we still have four um, pretty uh, substance substantial items on the agenda. So um, if we can keep any questions brief, also recognizing that we do also have this on coming to us on at our next meeting. So again, um, and we do also have to open a public hearing uh, as part of the requirement. So are there any questions from counselors? Councilor Pine. Yeah, thanks for the presentation, Luke. Um, I'm really pleased with where uh, CEDO has uh, decided to focus these resources. I really, I think you've identified the um, some of the most pressing needs and um, there's never enough, of course. So we. Uh, we have to be really careful and strategic about how we um, use these funds to really lift up people who are most impacted by this crisis. I want to just know um, the administration or the sort of management of a rental assistance program is is a pretty daunting undertaking. And um, the idea that it might be done by CEDO, I think was a bit of a red flag for me. I, I, I worry that a city department that's never done this, and I see Councillor Carpenter raised, shaking her head, she and I know this system very well. Um, I know way more about it than I'd like to admit, and I can tell you right now, it is a full-time undertaking for a large crew of people to just run a rental assistance program. So I just want to put a caution out there that it's not something you want to do take on lightly. Thank you, Councillor Pine. Councillor Carpenter? I mean, I would uh, reiterate that. Um, I also know that we're pretty close on the state level to a statewide rental assistance program. So it would be very important to be sort of coordinated with that. You know, so a tenant uh, is not having to go two places and sign up for two programs. I don't know a lot about all of the detail on the statewide program, um, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty close to being signed. So it would be key to coordinate that. The other thing, and I just want to mention it, and um, I've been in communication with Luke that 
somewhere in this pot of activity, I think it will also be important to have um, good foreclosure counseling and mortgage counseling. Um, we're gonna see that a little bit later in the year, I think not as quickly as evictions, but it's a resource we're gonna have to think about. Thank you. Uh, are there any other counselors with uh, questions? Councilor Jane, go ahead. Thank you, President Tracy, and thank you, Luke, for the presentation, much appreciated. Um, but my first question is maybe if you know, if surrounding communities such as Winooski, um, South Burlington, Colchester, Essex, if they are receiving similar grant from uh, the federal government, if you know? Yeah, it's a good question. So the uh, way Vermont is structured, essentially we have two communities that receive CDBG funds, Burlington and the rest of the state. And so they receive uh, CDBG funding on a statewide level and those are allocated uh, sort of around the state everywhere except for Burlington. And because we're an entitlement community ourselves, we receive our own sort of specific CDBG funding allotment. Okay, thank you. And um, I think there is this addition or before that, I think it will be imperative also to highlight that of the presentation and also even last year, um, the CDBG grant that we received were primarily uh, allocated to organizations um, that help low income people. And most of those organizations do not serve Burlington people alone. Now I was wondering if you receive data from those organizations around how many Burlington people are they, um, they, they have um, serviced? Do, do you have any idea? I don't have sort of specific data in front of me. I know there are a number of rules and restrictions that require sort of the bulk of the activity to be directed into Burlington when they are when funds are awarded to organizations that sort of do services both inside and outside of Burlington. Um, but if you want more specificity to that, you know, I can ask uh, my colleague Todd to chime in on how we monitor that type of uh, compliance. Okay. Um, thank you. And I think, you know, I was a member of CDNR last year, and it was the same question that I'm asking here again in making sure that these dollars are specific to people who live and work here in Burlington. And also we need to ensure that every penny will go to Burlington residents. So it seems we don't have the data, but maybe we could work on putting those provision while working with those organizations. Now we also receive a $450,000 extra for our response to COVID-19. Now, I was wondering why couldn't we use that fund, that specific fund back to CEDO, the whole amount back to CEDO in uh, reimbursing um, the, the, the fees or the, uh, the amount we already allocated as part of our general budget. Why couldn't we use a 450 and just uh, pay back CEDO or um, any department that helped with COVID-19? Um. So, you know, one thing I'd say is we do, you know, I didn't get into it in the presentation, but, we, you know, CEDO does fund itself in part through CDBG grants through an administrative fee that's taken uh, and which we are anticipating taking from this 450 allotment. So we've sort of built in the cost of administering the program uh, into kind of the, the proposal that we've presented, uh, but we are being flexible in the sense that you know, as Councillor Pine and Councillor Carpenter were getting at it, it's complicated to run a rental, uh, any new program, especially a rental assistance program, if we decide that the way to meet the needs we've identified is best met by uh, awarding it out to an organization to do so, then those administrative fees would pass through, uh, you know, to that organization. So that, you know, partly we're still being flexible because we don't know what the state and federal response, what it will finally look like. So we are giving ourselves some flexibility right now. Okay. Um, yep, yeah, I think, you know, lastly, I think it would be also imperative to try to include the NPAs or at least give them a certain amount of this money because they know best the block that where they live in and was just wondering if we can put a mechanism in allowing them to um, disseminate the, the, these funds to, to the real people that live and work here. I'm sorry, the question is, 
the question is, I haven't seen any amount being uh, given to the NPAs uh, and was wondering what mechanism we can bring in place in making sure they access it and also disseminate it uh, in, 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 in their uh, communities. It's a, it's, it's a good point. So we do, you know, some of the work that, you know, CD, CEDO does through CDBG funded efforts is in direct support of the NPAs, my understanding is, uh, at least some of our HUD funded work directly supports the NPAs. Uh, but in terms of taking community feedback, we do rely on this uh, citizen public advisory board uh, to bring that feedback into the process. Uh, but yeah. You know, Okay. Uh, was just wondering maybe if Todd, you know, this we had this conversation last year, and was just wondering what what changed we 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 uh, you have worked on for this year. Yeah, um, a couple things. First, um, uh, Councillor Dang, I wanted to address the um, your question about how many Burlingtonians are served by CDBG, and. Um, Every September, we're required to submit um, something called the Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report, or CAPER, um, that describes exactly how many folks are served by the, by the, the Burlington uh, CDBG allocation. So um, I'd be happy to forward that document to you. Um, it's um, uh, certainly a public document, um, but I'll, uh, I'll forward that on to you. Um, the uh, the NPA question is um, a good one, and I, I guess I would um, also um, call on Councillor Pine to to uh, render some background as well. But just um, I just wanted to point out that uh, the CDBG advisory board that made the decisions on the vast majority of the CDBG funds that we receive um, have. And, and at least one representative from uh, each NPA. So the NPAs have a clear voice in this decision making. Um, and that has been the practice since the advisory board process began. Councilor Jenger, you all set? Thank you, yes. Okay, uh, are there any additional comments from councilors? Okay. Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Mayor, did you were you looking to get on? Okay, all right. Uh, with that, I will uh, then uh, open the public hearing. Uh, did the city clerk have anyone who wishing from the public wishing to speak to these this particular item and this item alone? Um, no, I have not gotten any requests for this item. Okay, all right. Given that there are no requests for this item, I will then go ahead and close the public forum. Again, uh, just for next steps for counselors, this is gonna be coming to us on our, at our June 1st meeting. So again, if you have additional questions, feel free to connect with the team at, at CEDO uh, with regards to this, but we will see this on our next agenda. We'll go ahead and move on to our next item. Thank you for being here. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to our next item, which is a item 7.04 a resolution. Uh, with regards to uh, the development agreement uh, a, uh, for Cambrian Rise. Is there a motion on the resolution? Councillor Pine. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would move to approve the resolution as proposed and request the floor back after a second. We have a motion, is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Jang. Councilor Pine, you have the floor. Thank you. The, um, the process for um, the Cambrian Rise Development Agreement Amendment uh, to be considered by the council uh, started uh, with the council anyway, um, after uh, or through our committee, our Community Development Neighborhood Revitalization Committee. I just wanna be clear for, for, I think the council gets this, but I think the public um, is under the impression that the council is vested with the authority to approve the changes to the project um, around issues of uh, parking and traffic and stormwater and all a host of issues that are really important in terms of development review. That's not what the council is actually vested with in this process. I wanna be clear that 
the council is is responsible for the development agreement, which is unusual. And the reason why we have a development agreement, we don't usually do this in, in development because development usually occurs on private property and the city goes through a regulatory process. What was unique here was that the city and the um, developer and the nonprofit uh, partners, if you will, came together and came up with this plan for um, roughly a third of the property being reserved for public access through trail, through a beach, um, you know, through essentially um, preserving in perpetuity a portion of the property, uh, again, about a third of the acreage. So um, the development agreement includes uh, things around uh, amenities for public transit. It includes how much senior housing there will be, how much family housing, how much rental housing, uh, how much homeownership housing, what type of mix of homeownership, mixes of uses, all of that. And so um, I just wanna be really clear with the public that that review process will still be followed to the T it's going to go through all local and state review processes if required. This is not a um, circumvention of any of those processes. This is really the council essentially being asked to allow for a reconfiguration of the project, which is really a response to um, real significant changes in the market, not due to COVID, but due to um, the notion of micro units and people choosing to live in really much smaller housing units than we've ever seen in Burlington before. Um, you know, 350 square foot um, units are, are even a, a less than half the size of your typical mobile home or um, manufactured home. So it's a, it's a really different project today in terms of what was envisioned uh, when it originally got permitted. And so it's a reconfiguration of both um, the residential portion of the project, but also some of the commercial uses are now being um, moved over towards residential. So there's a lot more residential being proposed. So um, someone mentioned a height increase and um, in the material that we received from the developer, there is um, a, uh, a reconfiguration that does involve going to the maximum height allowable. And I don't actually have that in the material what that height limit is, but um, all of this needs to be reviewed within the context of the zoning ordinance and the development review process. So I just wanted to reiterate that as part of this process, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Pine. Uh, Councillor Paulino, and then I see you, Councillor Hightower. Go ahead, Councillor Paulino. I don't have much to add. I think Brian did an excellent job uh, introducing that, hitting all the high points, a few of the low points. I think that um, for me, um, you know, I did a lot of legwork um, last year on this, and um, I would encourage councillors to support it. Um, I think my main concern is traffic, but we are not, uh, you know, these units are not gonna get built tomorrow. Um, when they will be built exactly, um, it'll be a rollout and it'll be a gradual increase. So I don't think that it'll be a concentrated immediate problem um, and we will be able to mitigate it um, with the revenues uh, to the city coming out of this project. Um, so I would encourage council support. I think this is the kind of building that we want to have in our neighborhoods. Um, we want people to live in a small area, um, in a condensed area in order for, uh, because we don't have many spaces to build on and because it's more energy efficient. So I really think this is a good project. Thank you. Councilor Paulino, Councilor Hightower. You're muted. Oh, sorry. I, Paulino just spoke. Um, thank you, President Tracy. Um, I am, I was one of the, I was on the committee that um, proposed or that put forward this resolution. I will say I'm a little bit disappointed. Um, by how this was explained and introduced to me and also disappointed myself for failing to catch that there was also a height increase baked into this. I felt like every time we talked about it, we talked about that this wouldn't change the envelope of the buildings, um, which I guess I understood an envelope to be three-dimensional, which is not necessarily true. Um, and so I really wasn't factoring that into some of the like discussions we had after that um, regarding, you know, like how this would affect 
um, traffic, how this would affect the neighborhood. Um, so I'm disappointed and that that didn't come up during the conversations. I'm disappointed in myself that I didn't read the memo well enough to flag that for myself. Um, but I definitely think that that should be a consideration going forward. Um, and I would highly encourage um, Councilor Carpenter, Councilor Dang, and Councilor Paulino to start um, to encourage um, the developer to come before NPAs as soon as possible to notify them that this is not just a increase in the number of units that will be shuffling around square footage, but that it's also potentially an increase in square footage, which um, is not, I think, how it was originally presented. So I wanted to flag that. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Councillor Hansen. Great. I'll try to speak loudly. I changed the setup of my computer, so hopefully you can hear me a little bit better. Um, so yeah, I've done a lot of a lot of engaging with folks on this issue over the last few days. It's been, <laughs> and can you still not hear me well? Yeah. All right. I'll keep I'll keep yelling. Um, so yeah, I've been talking to a lot of folks about this issue and. It's been a little bit of a tight time frame to consider this, but um, I've made the time to try to really dive in on it. Uh, I don't have any issue, and I think there's a lot of benefits of, of adding more units. Um, what I have been concerned about is um, the transportation impacts, and particularly um, as it relates to how we're changing our culture and we're changing our regulations and policies as a city around parking and around transportation. Um, we're in the process of changing um, our ordinance around minimum parking requirements and, and really shifting that mindset, I think in a very positive direction to, instead of forcing developers to build um, high amounts of parking, we are instead having developers support alternative forms of transportation, which I think is, is a great step in the right direction. Um, the timing of this project is interesting. It's, a, it's a, obviously a huge project and um, it, it, it might be getting um, it might be getting permits slightly before we finish um, enacting that new policy that I reference. Um, so I was able to engage with the developer and engage in a lot of other folks on how we could in this huge development, how, how could we potentially incorporate this new model that the city is shifting towards. Um, and I think we were able to, we were able to make some progress on that. Um, and I'm gonna send around language for an amendment that I would like to propose along those lines. Um, so I'll send that around. I've, I sent it earlier in the day to, to city staff. Um, I'll send it around to the council just for people who want the visual, um, but, so what the amendment what the amendment would be, um, and it should be in your inboxes now, um, is that for all rental units, the development, sorry, um, for all rental units, um, the developer shall decouple the cost of, of a parking space from the cost of housing, such that a tenant utilizing one or two parking spaces pay no less than $50 a month for each parking space they use, while tenants who do not own a car and do not utilize a parking space will not pay for parking. This requirement applies to all residential lease agreements that commence July 1, 2020 or later. It does not impact current lease agreements. While this requirement does not apply retroactively to Cathedral Square Corporation's Juniper House or Champlain Housing Trust's Laurentide, we strongly encourage these entities to similarly decouple parking costs from housing costs. The developer shall at least once per year for the next five years, share with the city council the parking lot utilization data, including but not limited to the number of parking spaces occupied and the number of spaces empty at various times of the week. Um, example being 1 p.m. on a weekend, 10 a.m. on a weekday and 10 p.m um on a weekday um so that language should be in everyone's inbox and the city staff has that um and i would like to move that we amend the 
development agreement to include that language. We have a motion. Is there a second to council? A seconded by Councillor Stromberg. Um, before I open discussion, has everyone had a chance to review that language? Does everyone see that language in their inbox? Mm -hmm. And if I could have the floor back, Councillor Tracy. Okay. All right. You have the floor. Okay. I'll try to wrap up. Uh, I know it's a long amendment, but there's been a lot of legwork over the past few days that has gone into this, a lot of thinking that has gone into it and discussion. Um, and the idea is that we don't want to force people who don't have a car um, or maybe who have one car instead of two, we don't want to force them to subsidize people who have one or two cars. We, you know, that that is a backwards approach because that's pushing us in the direction of more cars rather than less. And when we're trying to move towards a more sustainable transportation system for a number of reasons. So I think this is kind of undoing that perverse incentive. Um, and it's also allowing housing costs to come down because we're not forcing the cost of parking to get shifted into the cost of housing. Um, so this is the same mentality again that um, is informing our policy changes that we're making as a city um, that I think also can be incorporated into this development. Um, and I'm happy to say that after talking a lot with Eric Hofstra, the developer, um, this language is, is acceptable. And if we do include it, um, if we do add this to the development agreement, um, the developer is willing to accept that in the agreement. I'll second, Councillor Anton. Yes. Okay. I had Councillor Mason and Freeman in the queue for on the underlying. Councillor Mason, did you want to speak to the amendment or do you still want to speak to the underlying? Um, I want to speak to the amendment. Um, okay, go ahead. I'm slightly concerned that it's at 940 for the first time there seems to be a ma relatively material amendment being thrown out uh, it seems a little inconsistent with our protocol i mean i respect that jack has been working on this for a couple days but unbeknownst to anyone my other concern is i appreciate this is based on um something that's come out of the planning commission but it has not been presented or adopted by the council. So it presupposes that whatever, you know, that policy or removal of parking minimums um, will be adopted by the council. I respect um, what he's trying to do, but I'm very concerned about what this establishes in terms of a precedent going forward. Thank you, Councillor Mason. I have Councillor Freeman, then Carpenter, and I see both of you, Paulino and Hanson. So Councilor Freeman, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. I um, will be supporting um, this amendment. Um, I think that it's a good step in terms of um, really thinking critically about what um, the climate centric design could look like going forward. Um, I don't want it to presuppose um, that an ordinance would take place, like that that change is going to take place, um, but um, I see it as being in alignment with my values and the kind of ordinances that I see as being um, necessary and vital moving forward. Um, I would like to say that the um, piece on the um, utilization of parking, I really appreciate. Um, I was a bit, um, I'm dismayed by considering how much parking um, might actually be built on this project, um, given not just the traffic concerns, but obviously um, the sort of climate and pollution concerns of car-based um, travel and car-based design. Um, I know, um, Mr. Farrell, are you on the call and potentially available to just answer a question or two about that component? I am. Hi, Eric. Thank you for being uh, on the call. Howdy. Hi. Um, yeah, I did want to, I know we got a chance to um, talk sort of initially and um, you answered a of quite a number of my questions um, then I was curious um, and I just looked through the memo again but I didn't see how, how many parking spaces are anticipated um, for this project I think you... there's I think there's around a thousand spaces okay um, and from where you're sort of 
configuring the, the designs and um, perceiving the design going forward, do you um, anticipate any reduction in that? Or do you, to me, a thousand parking spaces sounds like um, a lot and would and really and concerns me um, that we're so, um, that we would be building a project that would be so um, car centric basically and not, um, yeah. Do you, do you, do you anticipate it staying at that or do you? Well, I, I don't think it's a lot of spaces given the number of units, but um, let me say a couple of things. So we've done, uh, we think we've taken extraordinary measures to get people out of their cars. We share the uh, Jack's uh, desire to accomplish that because we don't, uh, the, you know, we just soon maintain less and build fewer parking uh, spaces, but that uh, requires a change in people's habits and their culture. And so we, we built the second nicest and probably the second most expensive bus stop in the city of Burlington. And uh, we have car share. We're soon to have bike share. We're connected to the bike path. We're members of CATMA. So we're doing everything we can to provide alternative modes of transportation, but that doesn't necessarily get people out of their cars. Um, interestingly enough, we had already undertaken discussions in our own company about decoupling the cost of parking. Um, and I have talked to Jack about it recently. And so we're, uh, I, I don't have, I don't take any issue with the amendment, uh, regardless of whether the ordinance ultimately passes, uh, that, that might apply elsewhere um, in the, in the city. So um, the other thing that, the other initiative that we are undertaking is that um, we want to build less structured parking and more surface parking. And the reason for that is once you build structured parking, somebody's got to pay for it and there's no going back after you have made that huge commitment. Whereas, uh, for example, at Liberty House, we built um, surface parking, but it's a gravel lot. We're going to continue that strategy going forward so that if we are successful in getting people out of their cars and reducing the total number of cars per unit or cars per occupant, then we can reclaim uh, some of that surface parking. We might not even pave it at, at the outset, um, but that's not an opportunity available to us if we build structured parking. So structured parking is nice in terms of reducing coverage, uh, but it's a huge long-term car-centric commitment, which we would rather not uh, make. We're still going to have a lot of structured parking, but uh, not as much as we originally planned. Okay, thank you for um, providing some more information on that. And I, I would love to, um, I, you know, I've heard other people's concerns around traffic. I think that was an initial concern. Um, I think we are, unfortunately, have a really packed agenda for tonight's meeting. So I think um, I'll follow up with that um, offline and it doesn't directly pertain to this amendment as well. But um, that is something that I'm curious about following up with and I appreciate that others brought it up as well. And thank you for jumping onto this um, or being on the call, but jumping on and, and being willing to answer some questions. I really appreciate that. I, I, I'd like to make one other comment, if you don't mind, uh, to address Zariah's <laughs> comment about height. Of course, we're not before you asking for any Mr. relief. Farrell, Mr. Yeah. Farrell, if you could please just save that we're on the amendment um, so that hey, that's not germane to our discussion right now. That's fine. Um, thank we, I'll, I'll recognize you again uh, when we get back to the original motion. Um, Councilor Carpenter, you're in the queue. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, to the amendment, I, I totally, I support it, but I'm really concerned about this, the process of this just popping up. We didn't talk about it at CDNR. Um, uh, you know, we, we haven't, we're really moving in to questions that seem to me more zoning and development review board related, as opposed to development, which is really a higher level um, concept about, you know, who occupies this piece of property? Is it small apartments, big apartments, and a hotel? Uh, office space and so I'm just concerned about the process of kind of on the fly adding adding an amendment like this with sort of out of the blue and I, and I guess I had a question for um, Eric if if we defer this is, is this going to be a problem I mean um, 
I don't know what the timing of the development agreement is is for you. Um, I and I want to say how supportive I am. This is a fabulous project and it meets all of our goals. So I don't want to do anything to delay it, but I just want to make sure that we're mindful of all the nuance of what's being proposed and its effect. And there are some nuances even on noting the exceptions for Cathedral Square and CHT when you combine parking fees with some of the federal subsidy programs, you just get into problems. And sometimes you get into problems with that with mortgage financing on condominiums. And I just want to be sure we've thought it all out, even though it's it's the right thing to do. Um, can I respond to that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, some of you will remember you that have been on the board for a while. I started this process uh, nearly a year ago. So this is not a... Um, uh, this has not been a speedy process. It's not a snap decision. It's uh, I've talked to uh, every counselor, uh, new and old, and most tours of the property, some recently, some last summer. And so um, uh, I need to move on with planning. This is holding up our, our long range planning process. And so if you're so disposed to approve this, I'd like to I'd like to get it done, and so that I can get on to uh, the work that we need to do to plan this project. I don't really want it delayed. All set, Councilor Carpenter. Okay, Councilor Paulino. Uh, <clears throat> I would encourage uh, councilors to vote against this amendment. Um, I appreciate the intent behind it. I appreciate the goal. Uh, I think this amendment is its own resolution and it very much is. It hasn't been finalized yet. I don't think it's appropriate for us at public forum when a Burlington resident has come before us asking for um, essentially uh, an agreement that's been reached um, and now is being amended and we're substantially and meaningfully altering that agreement on the floor um i don't think it's fair it's i appreciate i i'm very thankful that mr farrell is is okay with it but i think we also owe it to those future tenants to vet this the right way for example in reading one of the sentences it says while this requirement does not retroactively apply to cathedral square um we encourage them to decouple parking costs so I understand that Cathedral Square, Juniper House, CHT, it, as written, it applies proactively. Um, so, and as I understand, their federal subsidies do not allow them to decouple parking at this time. So I just think this is problematic in, in, from a procedural standpoint, even though the goal I appreciate. Um, I appreciate that we're trying to encourage people to not own cars, to drive less, to use alternative forms of transportation. But we are also, um, you know, the, there are tenants now that are gonna have to pay for parking um, starting July 1 of this year uh, that didn't expect to do that and they should have a right to be heard. And just because I agree with the intent of something doesn't mean I will rob the public process and follow the procedure that we've previously had. And, not to add such a substantial meaningful amendment that it alters the essentially the resolution in my opinion thank you thank you councilor paulino councilor hansen great thanks sorry eric i called you eric hofstra i meant eric farrell i wonder that's probably I took, a, I took it as a compliment <laughs> um so yeah i mean i'll be honest i mean we're talking about process I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not too happy with the process. I mean, we got, this is, this is a pretty substantial discussion that we only had a few days to snap into action onto. And believe me, I used a ton of the time that we had. I dropped almost everything else to work very hard to work with many folks, including the developer to come up with this language. Um, and I'm, ha I'm happy to take more time to, to work through this. Um, but I was the reason I put so much time into it is because there was a concern about trying to get this done for Monday. And so again, I did I used the most of the time that I was given to review this to try to push for something. And 
you know, in my opinion, our role as city councilors in these development agreements and in any situation, anything we're considering is to try to make it better on behalf of the public. And I think there's pretty widespread agreement among councilors that this would make the project better. And we have the developer sitting here saying that he's amenable to these changes. And we put a lot of work back and forth, the two of us to achieve them. And now they're sitting here for us to improve this project. All we have to do is say yes to it. So I, I really would encourage folks, if you think this is gonna improve the project, here's your opportunity. If you feel like we need more time, then you can propose that we take more time to, to, to look at this. And I'm fine with that, I would support that. Um, but again, many people wanna move on this. And if that's the case, here's our chance right now to, to make it better. Um, and I just wanna be clear, the reason we arrived at this language and the reason that Eric supports the language is because we did carve out CHT um, and we carved out Cathedral Square and we carved out the condominiums. So that's why he supports this and that's why it ended up the way it is. Um, if, if, you know, if the word retroactively somehow nullifies that, we can fix that word because that's not the intention. The intention is to carve out those entities for which this doesn't apply. And that's why we came to an agreement on it. That's not a difficult fix whatsoever, especially when there's widespread agreement around it. So if you believe that this will make the project better and we have the developers sitting here ready to go, please, please support this. Thank you, Councilor Hansen. Councilor Shannon. Thank you, President Tracy. Um, I do appreciate the goals of this amendment, but uh, a counselor working out a special deal with the developer is not appropriate public process. And especially something that has gone on as long as this, our timeline to affect this didn't start on Thursday when our agenda appeared. Um, Mr. Farrell has been meeting with all of us for months, um, has let us know about this probably back in the fall at least. And if we wanted to work in some deal, there, there was a, a very lengthy process where that could have been done. To spring, spring this on us at this moment, almost at 10 o'clock at night, as we're ready to approve an agreement, um, and you know, that, that's not okay. Uh, when you write things like these, the, write things like this, there's a possibility for unintended consequences and it should go through a committee process. Um, it should not be decided at this hour on the floor. And for that reason, not because of the merits of it, I will not be supporting this. And I hope that other counselors, even who think this is a good idea, won't support a process like this. Thank you. Counselor Hightower. Um, yeah, so hearing a lot of the concerns, I want to flag that I do think that development agreements at least are the right time to do this. I think that the proposed changes have a very credible impact on parking and not doing anything to limit parking at the same time would greatly hurt some of the um, residents of the New North End as well as this project specifically. Um, Eric, I just want to ask a clarifying question if that's okay. The $50 shift to um, Councillor Paulina's point, that's supposed to be a reduction of the rent, right? Not an additional $50 that they weren't. So if you don't have a car, you reduce the rent by 50. If you um, do have a car, the rent stays the same. That's, that is correct. And if you have an extra car, then you, then you pay extra. We had already instituted our own policy of charging for a second car to discourage people. And so I, I I appreciate all of this conversation about process. I don't want to be, I don't want to be the baby that goes out with the bathwater. This is a very important um, project for us. I think it's, uh, I think that the amendment notwithstanding the process ha is, is, uh, has a lot of merit. We, we, we enthusiastically support doing that. And so even I, I, I would rather you guys fight among yourselves about process going forward and don't make me pay the price for the process. 
I don't want to, I don't want to go out with the bathwater, please. Thank you, Eric. And then I guess my closing point on that is I, having been on the DRB, I know how pro parking they are. I feel like this is one of our few kind of instances to signal for the process going forward that we don't want just right next to the lake to be a huge like surface parking lot. Not, and I understand the reasons that um, Mr. Farrell wants to move towards surface parking, but I feel like that is so unideal and increasing the amount of um, units by 180 units without doing something to address the parking issue, I definitely would vote no on that. I think that is very concerning, especially considering the height increase. So we could even be talking about, you know, increased bedrooms, um, just more units and just as much surface space and of the original unit. So I feel like there's a serious car issue that we should, that we need to talk about without just passing it. Sorry, that was long and confusing. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Uh, Councillor Jing. Uh, thank you, President Tracy. And I think before I start, I wanted to thank Mr. Eric for his courage, um, for his vision about housing and also development. And I think the merit about this is specific to the experience we have with all the developers. Now in front of us, we have a developer who delivers, who makes agreement, respect them and move us forward. That I wanna thank you for that. But I wanted to respond to just a comment that I heard here about process, about um, a counselor making deals with a developer. I think that counselor, Jack Henson has done what we call due diligence. And he has done it beautifully by reaching out to the developer and trying to come up with them um, um, agreements that move us forward. Jack did not start it here right now, but he's been working with him outside of here and he has done a great job. Jack, thank you for that. And I am very much going to support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jane. Councillor Paul. Thank you. Thanks, President Tracy. Um, you know, I will agree with those people who have said that this, um, what we're doing this evening is, uh, uh, highly irregular. Uh, we we don't do this, um, and uh, that this approach is a bit unorthodox. We're the ones that are pat we're we're the ones that are voting on the development agreement. We don't negotiate the development agreement. Um, you know that being said, uh, I would I certainly would not be inclined to even consider supporting this were it not for the fact that uh, Eric is amenable to it. Um, and I do believe that uh, Councillor Hansen and the developer have worked together uh, to come up with something that is amenable to, um, to both of them. I have a feeling there probably was other language that Councillor Hansen wanted put it in, put in, and there was probably some that, count, that the developer did not, and they somehow or other figured out something that does make the project better. Um, uh, I would like to also say that um, to Eric that, you know, you, you did, I, I went out for a tour of Cambrian Rise last year. I can attest as I'm sure all of us can, that this is a developer who has done everything that we um, in the city want. Um, he's worked very hard to provide um, an ease for alternative modes of transportation. That's all we can really ask. And he's done more than what we can ask for. Um, and uh, uh, so while it is highly irregular and very unorthodox, um, I will vote to support uh, the amendment. Thank you. Thank and you. I also, and, uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. And I, and I, and I would, and I do hope that um, we can uh, approve this this evening. Um, you know, I think, I think Eric has been extremely patient with us. He needs to get going and I hope we can just move on this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Councillor Stromberg. Thank you. I'll be very quick. I know we have a lot to get to. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to Eric for reaching out to me and having really good conversation and answering all my questions. I felt very comfortable having a dialogue and supporting this project because it does promote accessibility and inclusivity. Um, I, to the points of, of, you know, the question of procedure, I understand the hesitation there, but I, 
you know, climate change is very time sensitive. And I know that, yes, Councillor Paul said it perfectly. It is unorth unorthodox, but I, I don't, I, I, I'm just going to say it blatantly. I didn't like the fact that it was mentioned that Council Hansen was making deals with anyone. That's, I think this was a very transparent process. Um, it might've been more communication on one side of the fence than the other, but I, you know, I feel like we could be more proactive moving forward. This is very imperfect how we're doing this, but I'm, you know, I'm excited about this project and I think this uh, amendment is extremely meaningful and mm -hmm. does make the difference for a lot of, people in Burlington. Um, so I'm excited to support it. And everyone else said everyone, everyone else said everything else I was thinking. So thank you. Okay, Councillor Freeman to be followed by Councillor Paulino and then P Councillor Pine. Um, again, folks, it's after 10. Um, so please keep comments, you know, let's try and move ourselves to a vote on the amendment and then to the, the final vote because we do still have three items on deliberative. Go ahead, Councillor Freeman. I have a point of information. Go ahead, Councilor Paulino. So my question is, uh, uh, I guess, for the either the person who drafted the amendment, because it says, I understood it. Can't hear you. There you go. So the way I read it, it says, if you own a car, you will pay no less than $50. So you will pay at least $50, if not more. So there will be no reduction if you do not own a car, but there will be essentially a tax a car tax if you own a car. Um, so my question is, there was some misunderstanding I heard a couple times that that it will be that it was the opposite that if you don't own a car, you pay less, and if you and if you do, you pay nothing. My second question is that uh, when I was talking about CHT, there's going to be some new IZ housing as a result of this increase, and according to the way it's written, any new IZ housing um, will be subject to this requirement, which I understand they can't comply with. So those are the two issues that I was uh, concerned about. Point of order. Uh, go ahead, Councilor Hanson. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to answer that, but how is that a point of order? That just seems like discussion of, of the item. I'm gonna agree with that and go to Councilor Freeman. Councilor Freeman, go ahead. I'll come to you next, Councilor, Councilor Paulino, and we'll get to those questions. But Councilor Freeman was in the queue ahead of you. So go ahead, Councilor Freeman. Wasn't it a point of information? Also, I think I'm on a lag. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Do you want me to go? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I just had a quick, um, I was confused about all the comments about bad process. Um, my understanding is that this was introduced to sort of the council as an idea from the administration and um, Mr. Farrell several weeks ago. It was meant to come directly to council. Um, and to not go to CDNR, I understand that there were some conversations that occurred um, last summer about this potential change to the cap from 770 to 950 units. Um, but my understanding is that it wasn't even intended to go to CDNR before coming to council, um, that the administration was given sort of, um, I, I guess I don't understand why the administration is given um, a unilateral um, place in sort of negotiating these. And I think also um, from my perspective, um, the developer has individually reached out to counselors um, to ask for their feedback. So I, around process, um, I, I don't see how this is um, like uncouth or, or um, unorthodox, I guess. It, it seems just like having a conversation. This is the development agreement. We're asking to reopen it. Um, what is, if you know, then it's on the table if we want to make changes to it. So I, I really don't understand that. Um, perspective around process. Um, I, you know, I hope there was good communication around it. I'm, you know, I apologize if folks did not get language until, um, you know, feeling like it's last minute. But um, in terms of the process, sort of leading up to um, tonight's meeting, I don't see it's. I don't. If you have a point of contention with the uh, with the substance of the amendment, I think that makes sense. But to me, the the process doesn't seem from my perspective out of the ordinary i think the other thing i would say is that um i understand that people were concerned about um retro not not having retro retroactive changes but having changes to the new lease um i did consider that myself but again because i don't think it's really um a fee it's more of a reduction um or like a benefit when you decouple 
Um, I think that that's an improvement, but I, um, Council Hansen can clarify that point because um, I think there's maybe some confusion around that. And then beyond that, I think that um, tenants broadly have been talking about wanting protections when their lease turns over. Um, a big one has been just um, not raising the rent. Um, and there's really big issues to talk about when the lease turns over. Um, and so decoupling parking and so that um, people without cars don't um, have, just don't, um, or rather the you're you just see the you see what you're paying rather you're not actually getting charged more you just um see it basically you're aware of what um it seems really minimal and it's not actually an additional cost at least from my understanding um and we've been talking i think tenants have been talking about really serious things about when um leases um when you renew your release and um the really unfortunate changes that can occur there um and so this doesn't really flag for me um, as a as a serious issue, though I did I did think about it. Check on what's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Freeman. Um, I had uh, Councillor uh, Paulino and Pine in the queue. Uh, again, folks, we really need to move towards a vote because we have a number of substantive items. Uh, Councillor Paulino. So I, I I stand by my point that I, I it was a point of information because I don't understand what's being proposed. In other words, there's conflicts. The question. In, in what is written says you will pay at least $50 or more, likely more. And, and the second part says retroactively doesn't apply to the agencies that can't comply with it, but it could prospectively in the future for any future units. And frankly, as written, you could argue it's, it's, uh, it could apply July 1st um, to new leases as well. Um, I appreciate Mr. Farrell saying uh, that uh, he doesn't want our, his whole resolution not to pass or, or the, you know, I understand it's a very big process, but my point is that we're voting on just the amendment first. So I'm, I'm asking that we consider the effect of this. And I don't believe it is inclusive of people who own a car is my point. They're all, and, and it's not appropriate for us to negotiate last minute in the ninth inning um, for something that's going on for months. Um, it, it's it's just not the right process by by its very definition the maker said that there's an ordinance in place addressing this and the public process for that hasn't been completed yet we're going to circumvent that now at the last minute and i'm just not okay with doing that there should be people i know i have i know people that live there and they all own cars and most of them don't drive but I, according to this resolution on the fly they will now pay more for rent. Uh, Mr. Farrell, Eric, are you able to answer uh, to clarify? Yes, uh, Franklin, that's not correct. Uh, all we've simply agreed to do is we're going to reallocate the rent that we currently charge and allocate part of it to parking and part of it to base rent for the unit. So if you if you have a car, you don't pay. If you have a car, it's included, uh, then 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 uh, your rent is, doesn't change. If you have two cars, you pay extra. If you don't have a car, you, you save money. I'm not, gonna, I'm, not, I'm not gonna charge extra for a car. I'm just allocating the rent that we collect, part for the apartment and part uh, for parking. That's the essence of decoupling. I just want to identify for folks who live there that there is a cost associated with owning a car. I'm not gonna penalize you for owning a car. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Is that, are you all set, Councilor Pine? Yep. Councilor Pine. I just wanted to um, to take a little bit of the spotlight off of Councilor Hansen because I um, I played a role in this uh, sort of conspiracy of goodwill. He, he, he expressed concern about parking. I knew Eric was amenable to some changes. I helped bring them together to come up with this. So please don't attack Councilor Hansen for some sort of nefarious circumvention of the process. This was just an attempt for to all of us to get to yes, that's all this was. Thank you, Councillor Pine. Councillor Paul. Well, thank, thank you, uh, President Tracy. Um, I'd like to uh, call the question, please. We have a motion to call the question uh, that takes two thirds. Um, so um, then that is a non-debatable non motion. Um, so um, we will go to a vote. Will the city clerk please call the roll? Councillor Carpenter. Aye. Councillor Jang. Is that a yes, Councillor Jang? Councillor Jang, please. That's a yes. 
Thank you. Councillor okay. Freeman? Yes. Councillor Hansen? Yes. Councillor Hightower? Yes. Councillor Mason? Councillor Mason? Calling the question. Oh. This is a motion, I'm calling the question. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. I'm seeing him affirming, affirming yes. Okay. Councillor Paul. <laughs> yes. Councillor Paulino. This is just on the amendment, right? This is on calling the question. We'll have a yes. vote to on the amendment after this if this passes. Yes. Councillor Pine. Yes. Councillor Shannon. Yes. Councillor Stromberg. Yes. City Council President Tracy. Yes. 12 ayes. So that passes unanimously. We will now move to a vote on the amendment itself. Um, will the city clerk please call the roll on the amendment? Councilor Carpenter? Yes. Councilor Jang? Is that a yes? That's a yes, sir. Councilor Freeman? Yes. Councillor Hansen? Yes. Councillor Hightower? Yes. Councillor Mason? No. no. Councillor Paul? Yes. Councillor Paulino? No. Councillor Pine? Yes. Councillor Shannon? No. Councillor Strongberg? Yes. City Council President Tracy? Yes. Nine ayes, three nays. Okay, that passes. And so we are back to debate on the original motion. Are there further, is there further discussion on this item? Again, recognizing that we still have three items in our deliberative agenda. Councilor Freeman, go ahead. I just had a, is, is Eric still on the line? I did have a quick question about the square footage and I know that he had wanted to actually speak to that. Oh, you're still there. Sorry, you, I, you moved in the um, in the tiles. Um, I, actually, I think you wanted to address Councillor Hightower's um, point about the square footage and that was actually my question um, because I understand that the sort of footage uh, horizontally of the project isn't really changing, but um, there were questions about the height and I'm wondering um, if we are seeing um, an increase in potentially of um, yeah height or square footage in terms of height. I don't. I don't. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm using the right term. It's getting late, but perhaps you know what I'm getting at, or someone else can fill in if I didn't ask the question correctly. Uh, Eric, are you prepared to answer that question? Sure. Um, so you may recall that this is a brand new ordinance that was written for this district at, uh, when, when we did the development agreement. It's an NAC district uh, and they wrote a new height ordinance for it, which is not dissimilar than other districts. Uh, we have uh, uh, several buildings that are already at the maximum height, um, but some of them are not. Uh, some buildings are six stories, some buildings are four stories. So. Um, on a case by case basis, we go back to the DRB and and sometimes we max out the height and sometimes we don't. Are you all does, that, does that answer your question, Perry? Um. So, so we're not asking, I'm not asking for a change in the height. We, you know, we still have to adhere to all of the underlying zoning and planning regulations that are in place. They've been in place for for quite a few years now. I think the, the question is, so if the units are increasing, I know that there's, you know, it's a lot of, there's these micro units that are part of the picture and all this sort of stuff. But mm. I think based on someone who called in from public comment, I think the concern was because you do, we do only have so much, um, you know, sort of square footage in the foundation that's allotted that that would imply maybe, um, or you could suppose that then that would, mean that you would have to sort of max out the height limit on more of the um, of the buildings. Is that fair to 
Well, so I, think, I, I think it's fair that some of the buildings will max out the height. And I think it's also fair that uh, many of the buildings that are already done uh, do not max out the height and, and won't max out the height. The height is not going to change just as a result or, or in, and only as a result of, of the increase in density. The increase in density is, is largely driven by the reduction of the size of units. Um, buildings grow and shrink and change size and shape based on market conditions that are that uh, you know and we'll build this project out over several years and it'll go through iterations over those years all within what's allowed under the zoning for that particular district okay i was just curious because people do end up asking a lot of questions about the character of the design and what that means and so um, i appreciate you um, elaborating on that thank you I think it, yeah, and I think it's fair to say the character of this neighborhood isn't going to change, and when it's all done, it's going to be spectacular. <laughs> Councillor Carpenter to be followed by Councillor Jane. Go ahead, Councillor Carpenter. If, if you could just re-explain what you what you have agreed to to date and what you haven't agreed to. You've agreed to fourteen buildings. Correct. You've agreed to um, what I'm going to call uh, a certain amount of footprint. Right. I mean, no, not necessarily. When I first approached uh, the mayor's office uh, last summer, what I did agree to was that was that we would stick with the number of buildings that we have. Um, but every building that we got originally approved, we've tweaked the footprint based on you know uh, tweaking of the designs, and so so the only thing I've agreed to is not to increase the number of buildings in terms of their height and their their precise their their footprints aren't going to change much but they they you know we do massage them around uh, um, as the process goes forward but what what is the buildable area what, what explain that then well the buildable area so this is a uh, this is in a district where you can build uh, it's a floor area ratio you can build two times the land area in total building square footage for us that means we could build about uh, close to 2 million square feet. We are currently approved for about a million one. Um, the district doesn't uh, regulate density per se. Um, so we might build a little bit more than uh, we might build a million two or a million three. We'll never get, you could never get close to the maximum amount of building area that's allowed theoretically in the district. And because you'd have to build a 10 story building to do that. It's just not possible. But when you say you've agreed to a million one or whatever the number is, that's what I'm trying to get at is how much more than that. No, we're, we are permitted currently for about a million one. Okay. The, the, only, the only thing that I agreed to in the development agreement is the cap on the density. And the only thing I agreed with, with the mayor is that I wouldn't ask for more, more buildings. Okay. Other than that, whatever the zoning allows is, uh, is fair game. Okay, and and I'm just um, theoretically, if you don't get the smaller units, you could build all three bedroom units and still have a bigger project. I mean, or you could build your hotel and have luxury suites or some such thing. I mean, those are all still presumably allowed. So, well, they are allowed. And the interesting thing is, if I were if 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 you weren't uh, disposed to increase the number of units, it would probably force me to build a lot more commercial area, which, which is not what I wanna do. Um, I don't think that's the best fit for that neighborhood, but in theory, I could build several hundred more thousand square feet of commercial area, which would just, which would just uh, exacerbate traffic, exacerbate parking, and it's just not the right thing. I, I think building more more residential units and smaller units is a, very appropriate for the, our location and for what the city needs. What's that, Councillor? And I, I was going to confirm it. If you don't get the units, you can build and most likely would build more commercial space. I would likely build more commercial. I'd have to, I'd have to build more commercial space. Yeah. What's that, Councillor Carpenter? Okay, Councillor Jang to be followed by Councillor Hightower and Paul. Again, folks, let's please try and move towards a vote because we do have those three additional items. Councillor Jang, go ahead. Yep, um, thank you, President. And I think it would be imperative from the get-go after the resolution was introduced to have Eric give a summary of an overview. I think we all received the, uh, the memo 
but I think there are many people uh, here that might not understand what we're talking about. I think for next time, it would be imperative. But Eric, I wanted to circle back around the traffic impact. So from 707 units, there were a traffic study. I, I believe so, right? Correct. And now, don't you think it would be better to wait until those 770 units to be occupied and fully operational to then think about adding more units to this, um, to, to the development? No, it's not, it's not practical, Ali, to do that be, because you have to do a serious amount of forward planning. What I do today is, is real, very much dependent on what I'm able to do you know, tomorrow. You have to be strategic about the way you built out a, build out a project that's going to take several years. And so you can't do something today and then wonder, well, am I going to be able to do this or that next year? I can't make today's commitments if I don't have some assurance as to where, where we're headed and what the end game is. But traffic, you know, traffic analysis is pretty, uh, pretty sophisticated and scientific today. So they're, they're, they're pretty good at, at predicting. And, and uh, our original traffic study was vetted not only by DPW, but VTRANS. Not sure why VTRANS looked at it. It's not a state highway, but they did and signed off on it. We had that traffic study updated. It was vetted by DPW. They signed off on it. So I, I think that uh, there should not be any real concerns about traffic impacts. The conclusion of the updated study was that the impacts would be pretty minimal, very similar to the, to the study that was approved uh, four or five years ago, three, four years ago. Yeah, so I mean, I think um, 180 apartments are being added, which mean 180 people and potentially 180 more cars and they all going to use North Avenue to go north or to go south, you know? And I really doubt that there won't be any significant impact on that, 180, you know? And 900 also parking lots uh, that we're talking about. So now that put aside, what's the plan in the community uh, engagement about this project? What do you have in vision moving forward, including the, the communities? Well, and, and, you know, we have to go through the, the, the entirety of the, of the local review process with the planning office and the DRB and Act 250. Every time we do an amendment, we've gotten three or four amendments since we were you know, first approved. And one thing I, should, I would like to correct, though, we were originally approved for about 125,000 square feet of non-residential space. And that's down, I think right now, our current plan is for about 25 or 30,000 square feet of commercial space. That's making up a lot of the difference in residential. In the re we're growing in the residential and residential doesn't have nearly the traffic impacts as commercial or, or non-residential uses. So by building more residential, we, we don't have to build more commercial space and, and, it and it balances out. Yeah, and I think what I meant is not maybe DRB and all of that, but it means the NPAs and also the people who live uh, in that area, we we probably we've probably made more trips to the MPA than any project in the city of Burlington. We went through forty five public meetings when we originally got our approvals. Many of those were MPA meetings. We went to uh, two and three and four and seven. We went several times, and we never hesitated. We I'm I'm happy to to talk about our project. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we're talking about the nine hundred fifty, the amended agreement. Right. How do we include the, the 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 communities? That's what I'm asking. Well, we would go back to the MPAs. Okay, thank it's you. It's part of the planning process. That's all I needed to know. Thank you so much. Yeah. Councilor Hightower to be followed by Councilor Paul. Go ahead, Councilor Hightower. I see you, Councilor Carpenter. Councilor Hightower, go ahead. Um, thank you, President Tracy. I think right now I'm a little bit debating between tabling this to time certain to give counselors a little bit more time to look at this with the proposed changes. Eric, I know that's the opposite of what you wanna see, um, but I guess I'd like David's quick input on what he thinks about the proposed amendment um, and where we're at. Um, sure, thank you, I'm happy to comment. Um, this is something that uh, the planning office has been working on um, with Eric really from the very beginning. And um, as he said, 
there's no there's nothing in this proposal that suggests to change the underlying zoning um, if he wanted to build to the maximum height limit of, of 75 feet um, for a senior housing or 65 feet he could do that right now um, what what's important about this proposal is that it allows him to build more housing units which is really a critical need as i think we all understand in the community so um, he's proposing to do it within within the 14 building um, structure or, or format that he um, is already permitted for. Um, I I see this as a as a very positive thing for the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Uh, it is 10:30, so we need a motion on the agenda. Councillor Paul, go ahead. Um, okay, I, I, I thank you, President Tracy. I actually wasn't going to make a motion to, um, didn't realize it was already 1030. Um, uh, I'll make a motion, uh, I'll make a motion that we um, extend our meeting to, um, to move um, items 7.05, 7.06, and 7.07. Okay, so there is a motion to suspend the rules and complete the deliberative agenda. Is there a, there's a second to that. Um, and I believe that that's non-debatable. Is that correct, Attorney Blackwood? Oh, um, I, th I think it's debatable if you want to debate it. Maybe you have to have a vote. Okay, any discussion on the, the motion to suspend the rules? Point of information. Point of order. Oh. Go ahead, Councillor Freeman. I, Freeman? Uh, yeah, I just called a quick point of information. You did say, Councillor Paul, 705, 706, and 707, the entire deliberative? I, yes. I did. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry, I won't yes. answer. Yeah, the entire deliberative agenda. Okay, that was all my point of information. I just wanted to make sure I knew what I was voting on. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion to suspend the rules? Councillor Paul. Thank you. Um, as I say, you sort of caught me off guard a, a, a little bit. Um, if there was any of the sponsors of the these items who was willing to put them to the 1st of June, if they are not completely time sensitive, uh, that's why I, I was just simply going to ask ask that. But if hearing none, I'm I'm happy. I will make that motion, which I've already made. Okay. So we have a motion. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of suspending the rules and completing our deliberative agenda, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. Uh, okay, so will the city clerk please call the roll? Councilor Carpenter. Aye. Councilor Jang. Yes. Councilor Freeman. Yes. <laughs> Councilor Hansen. Yes. Councillor Hightower? Yes. Councillor Mason? No. Councillor Paul? Yes. Councillor Paulino? Yes. Councillor Pine? Yes. Councillor Shannon? Yes. Councillor Stromberg? Yes. City Council President Tracy? Yes. 11 ayes, one nay. Okay, the motion passes, meaning that we will complete our deliberative agenda. We are still on item 7.04. Councillor Paul, mm -hmm. you have the floor. Councillor Paul, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, President Tracy. Um, we have been discussing this item for some time. Um, there is, uh, I believe there's only one thing and only one thing that, 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 that the developer has asked of us, and that is that we not delay any further. So with that in mind, I would like to call the question okay, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the resolution. There is a motion and a second. Uh, this is not debatable. We will go to a vote uh, on this item. Um, will the city clerk please call the roll? Councillor Carpenter? Aye. Councillor Jang? Yes. Councillor Freeman? Yes. Councillor Hansen? Uh, no. No. Councillor Hightower? Yes. <laughs> Councillor Mason? 
Yes. Councillor Paul? Yes. Councillor Paulino? Yes. Councillor Pine? Yes. Councillor Shannon? Yes. Councillor Strongberg? Yes. City Council President Tracy? Yes. 11 ayes, one nay. So that passes and we will now move to a vote on the uh, original resolution as amended. Um, will the city clerk please call the roll? Councillor Carpenter. Yes. Councillor Jang. Yes. Councillor Freeman. Yes. Councillor Hansen. Yes. Councillor Hightower. Yes. Councillor Mason. Yes. Councillor Paul. Yes. Councillor Paulino. Yes. Councillor Pine. Yes. Councillor Shannon. Yes. Councillor Strongberg. Yes. City Council President Tracy. Yes. 12 ayes. Thank you uh, for calling the roll and that item passes, which brings us to item 7.05, uh, a resolution. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank yes. You. Thank you for being here, Eric. Appreciate it. And um, that brings us to item 7.05, the resolution, decarbonization and electrification of buildings. Councillor Hansen, or I'm sorry. Yeah, Councillor Hansen, go ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, I will move to waive the reading and adopt the resolution and just quickly take the floor back after a second, please. Seconded by Councillor Pine. Go ahead, Councillor Hansen. Great, so the good thing about this, given how stacked this agenda is, is that we're not, we're not making policy right now with this. We are, what we're doing with this item is we are initiating a policy process um, that is laid out in the resolution that puts us on a path to explore options and ultimately um, draft an ordinance to debate um, around electrification and, and decarbonization of buildings in Burlington. Um, the idea and the intention is that we would um, try to first address new development and, and then also begin to address um, existing, which is gonna be a much more complicated process legally and otherwise. Um, so yeah, this is just to really say, we wanna explore this. We wanna develop policy to decarbonize buildings. Um, it doesn't predetermine how. You'll note there, that there are some particulars in terms of what we wanna consider as we look at different options. But again, it doesn't predetermine the outcome or the specifics of the policy. It just begins to define what options are laid out um, through this process as we debate it. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Hansen. Are there other councillors wishing to speak to this item? Sorry, if I could just one more thing, Councillor Tracy. Okay, go ahead, finish up. I just quickly want to just thank um, and acknowledge Councillor Busher who had initiated this process way back in October and just make sure to give her credit for initiating this all the way back then. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Are there other councillors wishing to speak to this item? Okay, uh, Councillor Stromberg, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'll just keep it brief because this isn't like super controversial or anything, but um, yeah, I really appreciate this. And I think that this is incredibly important, especially as we now have that standing agenda item um, for us to just kind of circle back to. And this is going to open up a lot of doors for for the policy discussions and climate addressing the climate crisis is not only a personal issue for me, um, but it's it's something that I ran on. It's the reason why I got involved in politics. So it's incredibly meaningful to me to know that we're really starting to take a stance and this could potentially affect any new building moving forward if we're serious about it. Um, so yeah, I just, I'm really excited to support this and, and move on. Thank you, Councillor Stromberg. Anyone else wishing to speak to this item? Seeing none, we will go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, this passes unanimously. I don't think Councillor Freeman. I'm sorry. It was an A. I'm an I. Sorry, I didn't. It didn't unmute when I hit it. Okay. 
Thank you, Councilor Paulino and Councilor Freeman for clarifying. Uh, that still passes unanimously. So we will uh, we will now move on to item uh, 7.06, which is a resolution uh, regarding the COVID-19 emergency order wearing face coverings required in retail stores. Councilor Shannon. You're muted, Councilor Shannon. Sorry about that. Uh, looks like somebody decided to print in here. So sorry about that noise. Um, it wasn't me. I'd like to make a motion to waive the reading and adopt the resolution that is labeled um, revised. And ask for the floor back after a second. A motion, is there a second? Councilor Stromberg, uh, you have the floor, Councilor Shannon. Uh, thank you. I think that everybody um, is aware of uh, of this issue. I, I really see this as kind of a workers' rights issue. Um, the governor has required workers to wear masks um, when they're at work in retail stores as we open up the stores to the public, but. Uh, the workers themselves would not be protected unless members of the public coming into the store were also wearing masks, nor would the customers be protected unless um, uh, you know, other customers were also wearing masks. So to make sure that everybody is protected from each other, uh, we have, I am offering this resolution and I appreciate the many co-sponsors that have signed on to this. I think that um, it's been well received by the retail community. It, and for the most part, there, there are people that disagree, but for the most part, I think the public really wants this to feel like they're, sh they're safe in the shopping environment. Um, and they want to support our downtown businesses, but they feel like they can't do that unless they feel protected. Uh, and there are a couple of um, changes that have come into this over the course of um, the time that I've circulated it to council counselors, including to allow um, to allow face shields, not just masks. And um, there was a request to uh, also include city buildings that are our public buildings should be included in this as well. So I would like to add an amendment there. And I would note that city employees are already required, they, they have certain masking requirements that are specific in the HR, um, in the HR policy. So uh, they would still have those requirements, um, but this would be for the public. And I asked uh, attorney Blackwood to draft some language. This is, uh, let me get it one second. On line 46, add additionally, members of the public are required to wear cloth face coverings or face shields over their nose and mouth while inside city buildings. City staff are required to wear face coverings as provided in the city's face covering policy. Um, I apologize, I thought that this had been amended into our resolution, but it had not. The language I just read came from the city attorney and attorney Blackwood, if you could share that um, with the clerk's office, I would appreciate it. And uh, I'm looking for a second to that amendment. See a, a second from um, Councillor uh, Hightower. Um, Councillor Shannon, you still have the floor. Um, and I'm all set, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, is there um, any, um, well, I guess we were still introducing the resolution, but is there discussion on the amendment that Councillor Shannon introduced? Councillor Jang. Yeah, I mean, I think I will support it. And I wondered why it was not initially um, added in there, but I think I will be supporting it. Now, I would want to also, on the same line, I would want to add another amendment. 
to the same amendment after line 49, I believe, to add another store, another specific location where COVID-19 could be easily transmitted. And as we all know, we all received uh, during public forum, the executive director for farmers market stated that they would like also to be included in this. It is a request for all the vendors uh, that work with her specifically. They request to be added in this resolution and would why not add Burlington farmers market after line 49. Okay, are folks clear on Councillor Jang's amendment to the amendment? Does everyone understand? Councillor Hansen? Um, Councillor Jang, could, would you, if you, or if Councillor Jang would be willing to clarify, just to remind us where the farmer's market is taking place this summer? It so they, I believe they are still working on it in terms of the specific location, but it will still be, will be outdoor. So they have different um, options, including the parking lot for Champlain, um, Champlain School. And I know that they will be opening on June 6th and they're still working on a specific location, but it will be definitely an outdoor location. Within got it, city. got it. Okay, no, that makes sense. I just wanted to clarify, I, I wanted to understand how much it, Shannon. Uh, is it, it seems like we're getting into discussion, but was there a second? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, good point. Uh, is there a second to Councillor Jeng's amendment to the amendment? Seconded by Councillor Carpenter. Please proceed. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, no, the, I just want to say the only reason I raised that is because there are certain locations, for example, the farmer's market used to be at City Hall Park that are highly public gathering outdoor spaces where I think we would be entering into new territory to require a mask in sort of a highly public outdoor shared space. Um, but I think a parking lot is to me is different because it's not a place where folks are gathering and they would really be going there specifically to go to the farmer's market. So for me, that that does make a difference, but because this because of that, I, I'll support that for sure. Okay, any further discussion on the amendment to the amendment? Uh, Councilor Shannon followed by, by Councilor Mason. I'm sorry, this is the first I've heard of that. And um, there are a lot of outdoor markets that are going to be happening this summer, including most of, of Church Street really becoming an outdoor market. And um, we've gotten a lot of support for this, but it's, it is partly because we're just talking about indoors and not beyond that. I don't really know how the public feels about um, taking the step of requiring masks in the outdoor environment. Um, and I'm also not sure if that's consistent with uh, the, the parameters that we were given by the governor's orders. So I would like the, because um, we were given, we were given authority to do this in, in retail stores, but um, I'd have to review that to even know if this is possible, but I'm not really comfortable because I'm not sure whether or not the public is with us and whether or not the science is with us on this particular decision. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. I see you, Councillor Jang. Um, Yes. I have Mason Hightower and then uh, Councillor Jing. So uh, Councillor Mason, go ahead on the amendment to the amendment. My, my comment was along the same lines. It was unclear to me whether Councillor Jang, he referred to it as the farmer's market, if he was referring specifically to the one on Pine Street or his amendment was intended as the language is written to apply to all farmer's market or all farmer, or, you know, all outdoor um, sales. On the assumption it's the latter and not the former, I share the concerns that Councillor Shannon has put forth, uh, as well as concern about public reaction. Thank you. Councillor Jeng, are you prepared to clarify? Yes, thank you. Um, and I think it is very clear also on line three of this resolution, it's, it was highlighted, especially in areas of significant community-based transmission. That's very clear and it does not exclude 
stores, it does not exclude many things. I think also, in addition, the director, we are talking about farmers market, not all the markets in Burlington, but specifically Burlington farmers market. The executive director, Mario Venko, did speak in public forum in front of all of us. She made that very simple and clear request that has already been approved and vetted by the vendors that she worked with. So reason why I think it would be imperative for the council to allow um, addition of Burlington Farmers Market into this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jang. Uh, Councilor Hightower. Um, won't, I, to keep it quick, I think I have the same thoughts as uh, Shannon and uh, Councilor Shannon and Mason. Um, especially wondering what that looks like for the posting requirements for like the entrances and so on to a public parking lot. Um, so I think I would defer to Councillor Shannon and which if she thinks this is appropriate given the new limitation that Councillor Jang just made. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter, go ahead. Um, I supported it because I, I wanted to support the woman who came from the farmer's market, but in second thinking it, it, it doesn't seem well thought out. I think we should just pass what's on the table. We can always add classes to this if right. we need to, and and things are going differently. I, Joan did a great job in getting a lot of support for the resolution as it is. I think we should just pass it as it is, and if we need to broaden it, we should do so. Thank you, uh, Councillor Freeman. I just I support we're encouraging people to wear them at the farmers markets as well people will be in close contact you can just put up a sign at the beginning of the parking lot it would be very very easy it's a place where people it, i imagine will be congregating if people are sneezing or coughing which hopefully they're not doing at the farmers market or they're not sick if they're coming and going to the farmers you're not in favor and it is you did um spearhead this resolution uh, I, I mean, you're breaking up a little bit. That makes it a not a, a not so friend. Can you hear me now? Yes. I understand. It makes it not, it's not the uh, as such. Councilor Freeman, you're breaking up again. I think it's internet. Uh, uh, I'm not getting anything. Uh, Councilor Freeman, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not getting anything. I, Councilor Freeman, I'm not getting anything. I'm going to have but, to. Can you hear me? No, I, I can't. You keep freezing up. Um, OK, I'm going to go to, it looks like, OK, I'm going to go to Councilor Carpenter. Just to say, everyone should be wearing a mask, and I support it. But this was very specific to a set of groups. We still just need to keep on doing our education. And like I said, I think we can add classes. If certain classes of businesses aren't complying, well, we can add them next meeting. OK. Councillor Freeman, I'm going to come back to you. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. My, my thought is just I don't understand why we wouldn't want to add the farmer's market. I mean, it is more open air, but people come into close proximity. You also have customers who are coming in close proximity to the people who they are receiving the goods from. So I guess just because I am in close proximity to people all the time, and I think that the science backs that it can, that the particles can linger in the air, that any area where there's any, just sort of um, broadly like, <sighs> people being in proximity to each other. I just, I guess I don't see it as a hindrance. And I was trying to say when it cut out that I apologize to Councillor Shannon because I know that you spearheaded this resolution and I don't want to um, create an unfriendly amendment on the floor. Um, but I just, I guess just working in healthcare and just thinking about the proximity that we have to people, it just doesn't seem like a problem to also loop in um, loop in farmers markets, which are another place of commerce. And also I think sign in terms of signage, you could just post one of those, I don't know what they're called, billboard things that you just prop up and say, please adhere to um, to 
to wearing face coverings. So that's that's my preference. Um, just wanted to put in my two cents. Okay, so we are still on the amendment to the amendment. Is there further discussion on the amendment to the amendment? Okay, looks like we're ready to a vote. Will the city go to a vote? Will the city clerk please call the roll? Councillor Carpenter. Nay. Councillor Jang. Yes. Councillor Freeman. Yes. Sorry, Councillor Carpenter again. What was your vote? No. Thank you. Councillor Hansen. Yes. Councillor Hightower. You're on mute. Uh, I didn't actually hear back from Councillor Shannon, so I'm going to say no. Councillor Mason. No. Councillor Paul. No. Councillor Paulino. No. Councillor Pine. Yes. Councillor Shannon. No. Councillor Strongberg. Yes. City Council President Tracy. Yes. Six eyes, six nays. The amendment to the amendment fails. We are back to the original amendment as put forth by uh, Councillor Shannon. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Okay, seeing none, we will go to a vote on the amendment. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the amendment to the resolution passes. We are back to the original motion. Is there further discussion on that? Councillor Hightower. Um, yes, and I apologize to do this again so late. I did post an amendment, which is on board docs, and I also sent to councillors, um, adding the language, whereas some members of the community, such as people with health concerns and people of color, especially young men of color, may be made unsafe by wearing a face covering, businesses should have an understanding of cultural competency and consider how to accommodate customers who may feel safe wearing masks. I'd like to amend the resolution. We have, a mo we have an amendment. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Stromberg. Uh, is there a further discussion on this amendment? Uh, I, did you want the floor back? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry about go that. Ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'd just like to thank Councillor um, Freeman for bringing this up and Councilor Shannon for being open to adding this. So very late in the game. So thank you for that. Awesome. Is there any further conversation? I just don't understand. Uh, Tracy. I'm sorry, Councilor Jane, go ahead. Yep. Um, maybe they can clarify a little bit what that amendment is trying to do. Councilor Heisar, yes. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think we've just seen enough um, acts of uh, violence against especially um, men of color. And we also have some concerns that some of the health concerns, maybe not listed by the CDC, would also make it harder um, for people to wear masks. So just generally want to flag for community members, business owners to approach anyone not wearing a mask with a sense of compassion and some cultural competency to understand that there could be very valid reasons that they're not wearing a mask around for their safety and making sure that I don't think this resolution is um, race neutral. So kind of calling that forward and saying that this is a potentially race-based issue. Councilor Jing, are you all set or do you have further comments? Um, yeah, maybe um, if I understand, so basically if people don't wear mask because they're people of color, we asking the store owners or the managers to understand that these might not understand what's going on. Is that the language? Is yes. that consistent? Okay. Councilor Jing, you all, are you all set? Um, I'm all set. Okay. Yeah. Any further discussion on the amendment? Councilor Hansen. Yeah, I just, I mean, for me, just to explain why I would support it, I mean, I think to me, what, what I see this as being about is basically racial profiling and racial profiling is already obviously 
pretty pervasive, but if someone, you know, if someone feels like they're more at risk of being racially profiled because of the face covering and, and how that could um, lead to additional risk of racial profiling, I think this is a good way to ask businesses to, to listen to that and be sensitive to that and be willing to, to, to hear that and take that seriously. So that's for me, how I, how I view it. And I, and I support that. Um, I don't know if I'm misinterpreting it based on the maker, but that's kind of my takeaway and, and why I support it. Councilor Mason. Um, thank you, uh, President Tracy. I, I had the same interpretation as, as Councilor Hansen, but I also want to be clear in supporting this. This to me does not say that if you're not wearing a mask and you're a person of color, you have to be allowed into a store. If a store owner, you know, as a matter of policy or a matter of city regulation wants to exclude someone for health, safety and welfare, that's permissible. There's also a scam going on where people who oppose these are asserting, you know, under the ADA. Sorry, and they have a right not to wear one. That is not true. If someone is not wearing a mask in your retail establishment, you do not have to let them in, whether it's because of an ADA or because of cultural sensitivity. I appreciate um, Councillor Hightower bringing this up. Um, and I hopefully, you know, I, I believe it will be adhered to. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. I have Councillor Freeman. Uh, Councillor Jenks, since you've already spoken on this, I'm going to go to Councillor Freeman first. Councillor Freeman, go ahead. Thank you. And I just want to pull up the language I had a question about because I was um, speaking back and forth with City Attorney Blackwood about um, sort of some of the things that Councillor Mason brought up. Sorry, this is not to, <laughs> this is just a clarification. I just jumped right into the, the technical aspect of it. But I, I am really curious about this because um, to Councillor Mason's sort of clarification, um, I do see in the resolve clauses that we have online 73 exceptions. Um, and so um, that does, basically my understanding is that the only people who would legally be accepted, and, and I, this is why I'm asking the city attorney for clarification because I think it is a little confusing at least for me, um, that um, like they couldn't refuse um, a child under the age of two, um, or someone who's having trouble breathing or unconscious, et cetera. Um, but then um, the way that the policy is written, um, that this other sort of like, if you're a person of color or if you um, are maybe not covered under the, as um, Councilor Hightower said, under the health issues considered to be um, under the CDC guidelines that you're not um, considered in that sort of accepted class. I don't know if that's the right term, but um, I just want a final clarification from the city attorney on that before I um, understand what we're voting on. Uh, attorney Blackwood, are you able to, to clarify? Um, not sure that I fully caught the, exactly what the question was, but but yes, we have, there are exceptions in, in what you are adopting for the CD, what the, the, the CDC recommendations. And, and in addition, there, there may be, like you have to try to accommodate someone who has a disability that may prevent them from being able to, to wear a mask, for example, if they have a, a breathing issue or something like that. So, because there are gonna be other laws that kick in. So there, there are, ways that people who can't wear masks can um, ask for accommodation and be able to to not wear a mask. And so and because so the CDC so this is so basically to your point the the other laws are kicking in so that would mean that it's not because of the way that the policy is written based on line 73 of the resolve clause but it has to do with as we um, exchanged in some of our emails sort of the underlying um, like if you're in a protected class, you're not like you're not able to just get kicked out of the store just on the base of like um, sort of like equal opportunity. Like if you're a person of color or woman, whatever it is, like if you're you can't be discriminated against just on face value. Like that's already an underlying, and those would kick in, um, and that has nothing to do with the policy. But is there anything within this policy that um, is uh, giving additional protection? I guess other than like the underlying. Would, or is it possible to do that within this policy or is that not within our purview as the city? I get, uh, giving additional protection to whom for what? 
Um, I mean, based on the conversation that we've been having so far, I mean, I think the question and what Councillor Mason um, brought up was around um, the question of like, if you're a person of color, you can, if and and or if you're someone who feels that you, I, I didn't. I'm sorry, Councillor Mason, because your um, Wi-Fi I think might have cut out or minded, but the um, I think you said something about people misutilizing ADA to suggest that they need, can't wear a mask but actually need to or something. I couldn't I couldn't hear it and I apologize fully. But you know there were sort of um, examples beyond what is written um, or what is sort of underlying. I guess does that make sense? All right. So 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 somebody a, a store owner can't say to someone you can't come in because of your race because of you know the, and and they can't use discriminatory things that are proxies for those um um those characteristics so that's and that's law and that's the law regardless of anything we do here what what this the the exceptions that are special in this regulation are those that are on line 73 through 77 though and and those are based on advice from the public health authority, which is kind of what this overarching uh, mask wearing is about. It's relying upon the public health authorities who are saying it's not safe for some people to wear masks and they're, and, and that's who we're accepting. There's also sets of discrimination laws. But now if a person, I think if, I, if we go back to like the issue that, that has, that started some of these emails back and forth, if a person of color um, came into a store without a mask and said, I'm not wearing a mask because I feel unsafe wearing a mask because of the, the, the way that people have treated um, people of my race who are wearing a mask, that, that is probably, that's a difficult one because I'm not sure that that's gonna be a basis for not justifiably not wearing a mask in a location where you're required to wear a mask. Okay, I think that um, that gives me a little bit more clarification um, and I don't wanna prolong the conversation anymore because it is getting late. Um, I do think that I'm, I'm really glad that um, Councillor Hightower is um, bringing forward the amendment for the resolve, I'm sorry, for the whereas clause, um, I think Perhaps I could have seen a resolved it being involved in the resolved clauses as well, but I think we're past that point now, and I will be supporting um, the amendment that um, Councillor Hightower and I worked on. And I appreciate your clarification, City Attorney Blackwood. Thank you, Councillor Freeman. Anyone else on the amendment? Councillor Jang. Yep, um, I, I definitely understand the intent of the amendment, but I don't think that I will be supporting it because it is sending a clear message that people of color or people from different ethnical background, this policy does not apply to you because you're different, or we are sending you to go contract the COVID-19, the virus. A policy is a policy and it should apply to everyone, regardless of their race, their ethnicity, or their background. Any store, it is required, it is required. But now the question is, if they don't have it, how fast can they go get it and come back? I will not be voting for this amendment because it send a message of discrimination to people who are different in this community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jang. Is there a further debate on the amendment? Seeing none, we will go to a vote. Will the city clerk please call, a roll, call the roll for the amendment? Councilor Carpenter. I couldn't hear you, Sarah. I mean, Councillor Carpenter. Yes. Councillor Jang. No. Councillor Freeman. Yes. Councillor Hansen. Yes. Sorry. Councillor Hyde. Councillor Hansen, can you just? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Hightower. Yes. Councillor Mason. Yes. Councillor Paul? Yes. Councillor Paulino? Yes. Councillor Pine? Yes. 
Councillor Shannon? Yes. Councillor Stromberg? Yes. City Council President Tracy? Yes. 11 ayes, one nay. The amendment passes and we are back to discussion on the original uh, resolution as amended. Uh, is there further discussion on the resolution as amended? Councillor Jang. Uh, thank you, Council President. Um, and I think I did ask these questions and uh, they were specific to enforcement of this resolution. What are the procedures in place in enforcing the resolution so that all members of these communities are required to, to wear masks? That's the question, uh, Mr. Tracy. Uh, does the maker of the resolution have an answer? It looks like, it, like uh, you do, Councillor mm -hmm. Shannon, go ahead. Yes, there's no enforcement mechanism included in this. There's no civil ticketing. Um, the truth of the matter is even where there is civil ticketing, I don't think that they're really um, issued much. Uh, enforcement is primarily just by request and a business owner could deny somebody service, but um, I would say that that's it. If uh, attorney Blackwood wants to correct me or expand upon that, I, I welcome that. Attorney Blackwood, do you have further, further information to offer? I don't really have anything to add. That was what I would have said. Thank you. Councilor Jing, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, so then I think then this resolution is almost uh, meaningless because you know you vote on a resolution and you're making things required and there is no way of enforcing them. It is just reminding me of a policy on Church Street um, asking people to not smoke on Church Street, but people smoke all the time. And when I asked that question, it was, I was told that, oh, basically it should be a community um, self enforcement. Basically you have to remind people. And for some people, it's not a good idea. If we bring policies, we should have ways of making sure that it is uh, required and it's also it is enforced. Um, that's 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 one. So then I I, I am also uh, wanted to add that some business owners um, did make it very clear to many of us that city should not get involved in such a policy, requiring people to wear masks. This should be at their discretion between the business owner and also the customer for their safety. Now we don't have. Uh, procedures in enforcing and also some business owners did not don't want this resolution to move forward I just wanted to put that out there and also another point that I wanted to add is why the city is not uh, going the extra mile in producing more masks and making sure that all stores right have access to them that they can be displayed and people, if they don't come in, if they come in without masks, they can take one, wear one, and start to do the shopping. And was just wondering if the city has that capacity. I was told no, but maybe the city can work on uh, adding more and at least giving each of the stores that apply for this resolution to have them uh, in their store for, for, for display. Councilor Shannon, would you like to provide an answer to that question? Yes, thank you. Um, there, there is a couple, there's a few points there. So the point of the resolution is really that without this resolution, um, individual store owners were left to their own discretion to decide whether or not they were going to require masks. And a lot of the store owners wanted to require masks, but they didn't want to be kind of the bad guy. And they, they wanted a level playing field. And so that's what this accomplishes. And I think it's an interesting comparison with the smoking ordinance, which actually does have teeth in that ordinance. And there is an ability to give tickets with that ordinance. It's not generally how that type of, of ordinance is, um, is enforced because usually you just ask somebody to stop smoking and they will stop smoking. Um, but that's kind of my point that we could put teeth in this ordinance, but effectively, 
it's going to be the same thing because people don't get tickets for this type of behavior. Um, uh, and with regard to the masks, the city has made 20,000, distributed 20,000 masks of, as of, I think last Friday and uh, purchased fabric to make those masks uh, and had a very successful campaign. We provided masks to all of the essential workers first and um, then expanded that to other workers and we've expanded that. We, we have provided masks to all of the senior housing facilities, um, to all of the nonprofits, uh, and, and the last phase was providing to the residents of Burlington. Um, I do think that we want to continue our mask making efforts, but we can, uh, as the city transitions to new efforts, which include really feeding people, um, there are lots of uh, community efforts and volunteer efforts, and I am part of it, to continue to produce masks and make sure that everybody has access to them. Thank you for that answer, Councillor Shannon. Uh, Councillor Hightower, did I, were you looking to be recognized? Okay, I'm sorry, I must, must have misread a, a wave or something. Uh, are there other councillors who wanted to, to get in on discussion on the, okay, Councillor Paulino, go ahead. I was gonna move to call the question. The question has been called, is there a second? Seconded by <laughs> Councillor Hightower, uh, not debatable. Uh, we'll go to a vote. Would the city clerk please call the roll? Councillor Carpenter. Okay. Councillor Jang. Nope. Councillor Freeman. Yes. Yes. Councillor Hansen. No. Councillor Hightower. Yes. Councillor Mason. Yes. Councillor Paul. Yes. Councillor Paulino. Yes. Councillor Pine? Yes. Councillor Shannon? Yes. Councillor Stromberg? Yes. City Council President Tracy? Yes. 10 ayes, two nays. That passes and the question is called. We will now move to a vote on the uh, underlying resolution as amended. Uh, will the city clerk please call the roll on that resolution? Councillor Carpenter? Aye. Councillor Jang? No. Nope. Councillor Freeman? Yes. Councillor Hansen? Yes. Councillor Hightower? Yes. Councillor Mason? Yes. Councillor Paul? Yes. Councillor Paulino? Yes. Councillor Pine? Yes. Councillor Shannon? Yes. Councillor Stromberg? Yes. City Council President Tracy? Yes. 11 eyes, one nay. <clears throat> that resolution passes, uh, which brings us to our final item of the night, uh, which is res which is a item 7.07, .07, a resolution uh, removal of Everyone Loves a Parade mural, Councilor Pine. Thank you, Mr. Tracy, uh, Council President Tracy. This should be a quick one. That was a joke, um, but, uh, <laughs> but um, I got that way too late. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, I, I know it's it's, it's kind of late for humor, but um, you know, and I had planned um, to make some pretty extensive remarks. I'll shrink them to the shortest I could possibly make on this topic. Oh, I would move the uh, move the resolution and uh, request a floor back after this. There a second, seconded by Councillor Hansen. You have the floor, Councillor Pine. Um, in light of the hour, I'll try to be as succinct as possible on this topic. Um, but I had to write this down because this is has been something that um, you know it, it it's a it's an issue that I think is it's it's fairly complicated, even though people on the outside look at it and think it's quite simple. Um, I was asked last fall when we were debating this as a council or getting ready to debate it in August, October of actually 2018, so a year and a half ago, what's the big deal with this mural? Um, I've had constituents say, um, it doesn't really bother me that much. Couldn't we just make some changes to it? Or couldn't we just put another mural uh, beside this mural or across the, the, the lane from this mural? Um, 
I just want to say that I have um, art. Art is not just an insignificant thing. It's not just something that you you know look at occasionally or go to a museum or flip through a magazine while you're um, you know uh, having a cup of coffee and that that's what art is. Art really fundamentally shapes our stereotypes, our, our images, our, our ideas, our conceptions of ourselves and of our society and of each other, and the roles that, that race plays in our history. Um, I, I personally feel um, that removing this mural is, is ultimately a symbolic gesture, but that, that, that undoing racism actually requires uh, us to take both substantive and symbolic steps to repair the damage that's been done. Um, I believe this mural is deeply problematic since it's ultimately a city commission of art that has divided us and caused pain in our community and does not accurately reflect our rich history as a people, as a place. Um, I, I think it's ultimately an exclusionary piece of work that essentially erases entire um, entire groups and races of people. It erases them, I'm sorry about that. Um, and it essentially implies that, that we are here in a great state, in a great community, almost entirely due to the work of, of people of European descent. And I think that that causes uh, real pain and, and real harm. So I, I think it's, again, while it's a small step compared with structural and systemic forms of racism, um, I think this action does a, says a great deal about our shared values of creating a community of inclusion and genuine belonging. And so even though we are a busy council, and even though it's really late at night, I would assert that it's always the right time to do the right thing. And I hope we'll join together tonight to pass this resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Pine. Is there further discussion on the motion? For the resolution. Councillor Hightower to be followed by Councillor Carpenter. Um, thank you, Councillor Tracy. I'm having a tough right, time right now because this was kind of going to be the one time that I took a long time and just gave a real speech about how I felt on this. Um, I've been really frustrated about this mural um, both like in terms of who has contacted me about it, in terms of like the difference in debate that I've seen about it, the rhetoric that I've seen about, about it. Um, I mean, when I, I don't know how much of this I should say now because I know that it's so late, but when I moved to Burlington, I saw the mural and I also thought that it was the whitest mural I've ever seen. Like Vermont is white, but not that white. Um, and one of the few unnamed people in it is indigenous. I mean, I think it's misguided, but I also feel like the response to it has been a little bit misguided. Um, I feel like communities of color are like in particular really struggling right now for reasons that we all know. And um, not right now, they're always struggling and struggling particularly right now. And as I'm racking my brain to try to figure out what to do about this, I'm filtering hate mail the tell, that's telling me that Vermonters own shotguns and hate niggers. I'm reading problematic language about the slum that Burlington has become on Front Porch Forum. And I'm also feeling pairing emails from supposed allies that I'd be racist not to take this up as the racist issue in our city. And that really only newcomers see this as a non-priority, which just isn't true. Or that if you like me, if, that if you're like me, you're a newcomer, um, your voice doesn't count, which I find extremely problematic. And so I understand that the vote that the council had on this previously, it didn't feel like a win because in a lot of ways it really wasn't. Um, there was so much work that was left to do, but I just feel so strongly that the work is not the only, that the mural is not the only work that is left to do. And it bothers me that this is the win that we're fighting for and who seems to be fighting for it people of color losing in Burlington in all kinds of ways. But instead of looking at that, it feels, and looking at the hard issues, the systemic issues that people of color are finding, um, we're finding ways to make Burlington look less problematic. And to me, it feels like we've doubled down with what I think honestly is some white privilege on um, removing this symbol of white guilt. And so if I were getting a flood of emails from 
white folks also talking about deaggregated data and pay gaps and police training, really the hard systemic issues. I wouldn't be as worried about this as I am, but the fact that this is the only race issue that's been brought up to me by white folks um, and that it's only been brought up to me by white folks until yesterday, I find problematic. Um, and so I don't really see this vote as a vote to bring forward the voices of marginalized folks. It does not feel to me like a stepping back of predominant culture to a lot of other cultures. Um, and I know I haven't been here very long and I'm just one person and not representative of people of color in Burlington. Um, but I did almost decide to vote no on this in protest, um, knowing that I may be the lone counselor to do so. Um, and if any of my counselor and if any of my other counselors do vote no, I hope that all of the activists remember that that lone vote could have been me before they decide to label it as racist. There are a lot of people. Sure. A lot Sorry, of people Councilor Hightower. Uh, Councilor Mason, will you please mute yourself? Thank you. Go ahead, Councilor Hightower. Thank you. There are a lot of people. There is a lot of reasons people vote yes or no, and I encourage you to not boil it down to one word. And I'm gonna close by saying that I will vote yes, because while I do not agree with the spirit of the resolution, I do agree with the heart of it, but I hope that all of the activists who have been working on this um, really step back and will work with Taisha, work with the indigenous communities, which I again have to like flag that I'm not representing and I have not heard from an indigenous person in this debate. Um, but I hope that they step back and work with these communities on issues that are close to them across the economic spectrum in Burlington, not for them, not lifting them up even, but really just supporting them on the issues that they bring forward. Um, and I apologize in advance for those of you who are disappointed by my voice. Um, I'm really not saying this to be divisive, but rather I'd like to start a conversation around how we have raised conversations in Burlington and the way that this was brought to me and how much I've heard about this from exclusively white folks until yesterday, um, I, I just has been bothersome to me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. I had Councillor Carpenter to be followed by Councillor Paulino. I see you, Councillor Stromberg. Councillor Carpenter. Thank you. It's hard for me to speak after listening to Zariah. Um, just from a white girl who's always been in Burlington. Um, you know, my interest in being a sponsor is to help us just move on. I think Councillor Pine is right. Art should not be hurtful. And we've got to move on and get the systemic issues worked on. So I feel like this action that's being proposed just helps us do this and we just need to get it done now. It's It's been too painful to keep waiting. Um, I had hoped that we could sort of wholeheartedly support moving on. I had suggested a few language changes that I'm gonna propose dropping and just adding for expedition that an option be to cover the mural as opposed to, to um, uh, remove it entirely. The, the resolution asks for a plan to be brought back and there would be more to that. So I'm just gonna propose an amendment um, that uh, two words be inserted on line 15. Okay, go ahead. Um, I propose that, I have it right in front of me, I gave it to you on line 15 that um, the, the City Council and Public Works Department work together by August 31st to cover or remove the mural to a suitable place. So that's the, pro the proposal. So the, the language that you'd be adding would be cover or? Yes, remove. Okay, all right. So is everybody clear on what the amendment is? Okay, is there a second to the amendment? Seconded by Councillor Stromberg. Is there any, any discussion on the amendment? I, I think this is an important. I'm sorry, Councillor Paulino, go ahead. I think that the intent of this amendment is very important right now. I think that, uh, as you heard in public forum, uh, constituents say that, uh, you know, some people 
to first of all, I, I'd like to start saying that there's nothing I can say that tops what Zariah says. I, I totally echo what she says. And I also echo, I come from this at a very weird angle. So I come from what Zariah has to say and then from Councilor uh, Carpenter's perspective as well, which is like, you know, a lot of my constituents just want to move forward and turn the page. And and like Zariah said, we need to start looking at elsewhere. And I think we, you know, this piece of art became something that wasn't, it wasn't, in my opinion, it was never intended to be that by anybody involved with the city, but perhaps maybe by the artist, you know, to be this controversial piece where people would talk about it. Um, and, and that I do believe that that was the intent to, to arise, you know, emotion from it. Um, and so I, I'm glad we're, have, we're having this debate. I'm glad we're voting on this. I think that the removal piece is really important for me because I have a fair amount of constituents that are very concerned about their tax bills. And if we can possibly mitigate the cost of removal, even by a few thousand by, by um, covering, it's very important. So thank you, uh, Council President Tracy. Thank you, uh, Councilor Paulino on the amendment. I saw Councilor Freeman, uh, would you like to, was that a hand, Councilor Freeman? It was, but I'm retracting it. It's okay. We can. Okay. Anyone can... else on Councillor Carpenter's amendment? Councillor Hansen. Yeah, I just for for me personally, and I'll speak more to the underlying when we get back to the underlying. But for the amendment, I I I just want to remove it. I don't really want to take kind of the half measure of covering it. Um, so I'm gonna. I I'm gonna vote no on the amendment, and I do want to talk about the resolution, but I'll wait till we get back to it. Okay. Anyone else? Councillor Pine, go ahead. Uh, Mr. President, if I could, I was going to ask on behalf of Councillor Jang, just because he lost contact with us for a while. I'm and back. I think I'm, I'm he's back. Not, he, he didn't get to hear the amendment because he was struggling with technology. So he's there speaking for himself. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that, Councillor Jang. Uh, Councillor Carpenter, can you please clarify your amendment for Councillor Jang? It, it's to add in line 15, add um, cover or remove. So it's adding the words cover or remove. The intent is that that could be an, a temporary option until such time the, the, um, the resolution calls that a full plan be brought back by September 30. So the point is that covering could be an option. Council Jing, are you clear on what the amendment is now? Yep. Okay, good. All right, Councilor Pine, did you have anything else? Okay, Councilor Jing. Yep, um, I think I received the amendment before and um, just made it clear back then that I will not be supporting it because covering the middle as it is right now, you putting the middle subject to more vandalism again. There are people who are in favor of removing it and some that are not in favor of removing it. Now, if you cover it, both of those groups can continue to vandalize it. I think it's when we taking action, we should not um, add water to it. Let's just remove it if that's what we want to do or leave it as it is, but no middle ground here. I won't be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jang. Anyone else on the amendment? Seeing none, we will go to a vote. Will the city clerk please call the roll? Councillor Carpenter? Aye. Councillor Jang? No. Councillor Freeman? No. Councillor Hansen? No. Councillor Hightower? Yes. Councillor Mason? Yes. Councillor Paul? Yes. Councillor Paulino? Yes. Councillor Pine? Yes. Councillor Shannon? Yes. Councillor Stromberg? Yes. City Council President Tracy? No. Eight ayes, four nays. The amendment passes. We are back to the original resolution as amended. Is there further discussion on, actually we had a queue going. Um, Councillor Paulino was in the queue to be followed by Councillor Stromberg. Councillor Paulino, do you want to be recognized on the original uh, resolution? Okay, Councillor Stromberg, I had you in the queue next. 
Yeah. Um, well, I just want to thank Zariah for being so open and, and it's not, you know, I just, I, you said it beautifully. I can't possibly measure up to that. I just, I want to bring up the fact that a lot of people reached out to me within my district and also just in general about the mural about this like not being the ideal time during COVID and I just want to say that you know we can't play into the narrative that there's a right time and a wrong time to address racial issues so I really I feel like it's also a good stance to say that no matter what is going on that this is something we're always going to address and I just I want to take pride in that as a council and as a, a group of people at you know, cares for one another and, and cares about how marginalized folks in society are feeling right now. And, you know, people are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. That's happening all over the news. We're seeing that everywhere. We're seeing so many different acts. And I just, I just, I, you know, I, I stand with you, Zariah, and support you. And, and I think that what you said was absolutely on the mark. And thank you. Okay. Uh, further discussion on the resolution? Councillor Shannon, to be followed by Councillor Hanson. Go ahead, Councillor Shannon. Thank you. Um, I want to say I really, like everybody else, I very much appreciate um, Councillor Hightower's insight and analysis and um, willingness to say what she said, because those were not easy things to say. Um, I have only been contacted by uh, white constituents about this issue. And I think that it's important to reach out to people who don't look like me um, in making a decision like this. And when I have done that, I have heard from many people exactly what Councillor Hightower was saying, that this is, um, that they had issues with the mural and they didn't like it. Um, and maybe a little bit different than Councillor Hightower, many, many said that um, it wasn't really a priority, but that they um, did not find it inclusive. And I don't think that that's what we want to present in the entry to Burlington. And I don't in any way dismiss the importance of removing it and replacing it with something that is more welcoming. And we went through a process to figure out how and what to do about this mural. And that process um, convened a group of people who were, um, as, uh, as somebody said in, from, uh, in um, public forum, they were strongly in favor of removal. And despite that, they went through a process of getting informed and understanding the whole realm of issues and they laid out a path for dealing with this, which we agreed to. Um, and we took action based on their recommendations. I don't think that this is something we should dismiss, but at the same time, I don't think that this has become a higher priority during COVID. And I was very much, um, concerned this weekend, we did a food distribution, Councillor uh, Paul, Councillor Mason and I, and with all of your help, we did a food distribution in the South End. And that was attended predominantly by, by people of color. And I think that Councillor Pine acknowledged that this is a symbolic effort. And it's a very costly symbolic effort. And to the extent that we have funds to uh, address racial issues and inequities, I think we should spend those funds at this point in time in ways that, that meet a very real need in our community that go beyond symbolic gestures that maybe make us feel good. Um, so in, in saying all of that, I'm not, I'm not defending the mural, but I am not willing to uh, change, to, to move this up on the priority list at this point in time, and I will be voting no. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Councillor Hansen. Thanks. Um, 
So I guess I would start off by saying that I'm glad that I'm glad that this mural has gotten us talking about um, issues of racial justice in the city. And, I, and I'm glad that the focus of the conversation and thanks largely to Councillor Hightower for opening it up in this way, but the focus of the conversation going beyond just the mural itself. Um, and the fact that Councillor Hightower within the mural discussion has faced racism is just highlights the need for us to do work much more deeply beyond beyond this particular mural. The mural itself, I find very problematic. I, I think the representation of, of Abenaki people and the lack of representation of people of color are both just completely inaccurate and damaging narratives that just reinforce harmful, um, a harmful narrative around white supremacy. And this is, this is a public display right in the heart of our downtown. So I think we need to get the mural down. I don't believe this mural should be up. Um, at the same time, to the points that have been raised, I really hope that we don't pat ourselves on the back for this. I think this is, let's, we, you know, hopefully this will spur us to continue to have deeper conversations and address more systemic issues. Um, and there's a benefit there, um, but removing a racist mural um, should be done and also shouldn't be considered, again, something to pat ourselves on the back. Um, so I definitely support doing it and I definitely support continuing to move forward, even within this discussion of kind of public art and public display, this opens up a new opportunity for how we wanna move forward and what do we wanna display at the heart of our downtown and who, who gets to lead that process and who wants to tell their story and use this space. So I think it opens that up. Um, and I think we need to continue to have all these other discussions as well. I don't like the idea of, you know, because we're removing the mural, we are deprioritizing inherently other things. I think we can get this done. I don't think we have to turn it into, I just don't, I don't accept that. I, I think it's on us to raise those other issues proactively and do that. I don't think the mural is preventing us from taking stronger stances and moving stronger policies around racial injustice. I think we should have been and should continue to step up more than we have been on that regardless of the mural. And I don't think the mural is an excuse or something to point at and say, this is why we're not doing that. We're not doing that because we haven't been doing that correctly. That being said though, I wanna acknowledge some of the work, you know, we are doing, I think more substantial work through creating this permanent senior position in city government. We have this new committee, we have set up forums to get deeper into this and and that's that's a win and you know i want to thank thank all the people who contributed to that and and made that happen and now let's let's use that let's utilize that structure that infrastructure that we built in our city government to to try to um undergo this process of of addressing other racial justice issues so um the hour's late i'll leave it there but those are some of my thoughts and i'll be voting yes Okay, thank you, Councillor Hansen. Councillor Freeman. Thank you, President Tracy. Yeah, I did also, um, you know, as others said, wanted to echo um, just appreciation for Councillor Hightower's comments. Um, I think that um, I have also, I think, in a lot of ways, felt the pivot that um, the conversation around um, race issues or just equity issues. Um, has like spotlighted this onto this mural um, when there are so many other, and I think Councillor Hightower put it really well, there are so many other systemic um, issues that are facing um, sort of the most vulnerable people in our community. And um, I would really like to see people um, proactively um, take those issues on. And um, I think the comment um, specifically around um, white guilt is a really um, is a really pointed one and really um, important and interesting and I think it's something for a lot of further reflection and um, I just really appreciated that as being part of the conversation. Um, I think 
you know, personally, like when I weigh out the fact that um, there was a young black man in our community who was given a traumatic brain injury due to a violent interaction with Burlington Police Department um, versus the mural, which I will be voting to take down. I absolutely don't think it should be up. Um, but that the the sort of obsession with the mural versus something that caused someone to have a brain injury um, is it really kind of has confounded me about um, how we're addressing sort of broader systemic issues and um, how the conversation has. Um, at times felt like it has evolved into um, sort of like a white savior or white guilt um, conversation around the mural without um, really leaving space to dig into deeper, um, probably much harder issues to address, but are really about foundational um, issues that we have um, as a community. So um, I absolutely, I see that, um, but just the mural is incredibly frustrating to me. Um, it depicts a version of history that is completely and absolutely false. It doesn't exist. Um, it's, I understand that there was some feedback at some point that it's not supposed to be historical, but I think it is used as a public education tool. Um, I feel frustrated when people will say that the mural should stay up because it shows our history and now our history is changing because we're becoming more diverse. Um, I think that that um, creates a lot of miseducation and confusion that um, Vermont was brown. Um, it was it became white through colonialism, through like through um, incredible amounts of violence, um, and also through um, forced migration of enslaved Black people. Um, that history is so incredibly violent, um, and putting up um, this this depiction of Vermont that it is white and predominant. There's also a lot of men in that mural. Um, it doesn't really. Um, it, it, it creates this sort of illusion about the history and how we got to where we are. And I think that really is bad for us. I think it's unhealthy. And I think it leads to confusion about um, really understanding broader systemic issues um, because people don't even have a context or a foundation um, to talk about those things um, and the inequity that has brought us to where we are. So I will be supporting taking down the mural um, and um, I'm looking forward to voting on this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Freeman. Are there any other councillors wishing to speak on this item? Councillor Jing. Uh, thank you, President Tracy. Um, so I'm sorry that I missed what Councillor Hightower was talking about. It seems many people um, address it in their comments. Um, I had technical difficulties, but I think it would be important also to highlight the hard work um, of um, Councillor Boucher, who before her um, departure from the council um, have provided courage, so much courage of someone who has been here more than all of us, who also has changed her mind over time about this mural. I think she was getting ready to introduce the similar resolution of taking the mural down and has started the background work with the administration. And we all know, many of us have uh, known what she has, um, the, the level of pushback she received during that process. I think it's important to say to her, thank you. Um, and also to, to highlight that also many people, former councillors who voted in favor of keeping the middle up are no longer here. They're no longer here. The middle could have been taken down way back when, when we recognized that as a city, we made an error commissioning a mural in 2009, in 2012, that is only highlighting businesses that participated financially in the, uh, for the creation of the mural. Um, a mural that did not get so much of community input, the mural that did not recognize the changing demographic of our city, as a city calling itself as a progressive and welcoming city, it lacked definitely the representation of what Burlington is about. We recognized it back then and the middle is still up. Then we have a problem. We have a deep problem. As leaders of this city, justice delayed, is justice denied? 
there are continuity of people saying, no, this middle should stay up, create a different middle, so many different arguments. And lately, the argument that I hear is about the cost. So now I have a question, Councillor Tracy. I don't know who, maybe Eileen, maybe Mr. Mayor, maybe Doreen, can tell us the cost associated in putting the middle down. I, I have no idea. I'm just hearing it's expensive. We don't have the money. We're going to put it in 2020, uh, 2021 budget. But I just wanted to understand how much it's going to take to unscrew the panels and store them away. Whoever can answer that question, Mr. Tracy. Thank you, Councillor Jang. Uh, Director Kraft, are you prepared to answer that question? I'm, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Director Kraft, go ahead. I believe, okay, we have you back. Uh, Director Kraft, can we? Yes, um, so this is not something that was put out to bid. Um, it is something that we just gathered um, from one uh, company. Uh, that was the company that worked with us when we repaired after the vandalism, this mural. And um, the cost that were represented for taking down the full mural, which is 60 panels, was somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20,000. And what um, Paul um, at that time suggested to us is that would just be to take the panels down. What that does not deal with is the amount of damage that is behind taking the panels down because each panel has dozens of holes that are about one inch wide uh, put into the masonry holding up the structure, as well as the wood panels that go uh, substrate, excuse me, that go horizontal and vertically um, and were glued to the wall to the old mural that exists behind. So that estimate um, is something that has not been done professionally. Uh, there was a round number given by the team at the marketplace and uh, of around 10,000. So that's where that number between 20 and 30,000 has come from. But I think it is something that as we move forward now, we're just going to have to have formal bids um, placed. Yeah. Um, Councilor Jane, you still have the floor. Thank you, D Director Kraft. Yeah, thank you, uh, Doreen. Um, yes, um, but I think it is always important also to highlight that when we talk about 15 to even $100,000, is it even better than the feeling, the hurt of people who live and work here in this community? Is it better? There should not be moral. The moral, we should always go with what's right and do it right. Now, also, we know that the, uh, the, the BCA has commissioned, um, uh, is working to commission a new mural. And DPW has pledged over $40,000 to match a grant that BCA was applying to commission a new mural. Why can't we use those $40,000 to take the mural down today, tonight, right? I think it is important for the sake of inclusivity, for the sake of working against racism, against discrimination to take the middle today. And then that will allow us to move forward. I am very concerned about the aspect of covering the middle. It will even, it's even harder, especially for those who support to keep it, to keep it there. Um, I will keep my comments to that at this point. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Cheng. Is there additional uh, comments uh, regarding the resolution? Seeing none, we will go to a vote. Will the city clerk please call the roll? Councillor Carpenter? Yay. Councillor Cheng? Councillor Cheng, couldn't hear you. Yes. 
Councillor Freeman. Yes. Councillor Hansen. Yes. Councillor Hightower. Yes. Councillor Mason. Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Paul. Yes. Councillor Paulino. Yes. Councillor Pine. Yes. Councillor Shannon. No. Councillor Stromberg. Yes. City Council President Tracy. Yes. 11 ayes, one nay. The resolution passes. Uh, a motion to adjourn is in order. The move by Councillor Pine, seconded by Councillor Freeman. Uh, any discussion? All those, no, seeing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 None. Okay, we are adjourned at 11.56. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night.